background Stephen. <laughs> thank you i figured i would i would change it up a little bit for the uh, public hearing so steve as we gather i'm just going to state for the record since, since it's being recorded the select board is actually already called to order we met in executive session and we just exited executive session so we are called to order right now thank you <clears throat> Eight. I believe we're missing one advisory member at the moment. Who's that? Drew, Drew Cashel. Um, if anybody from advisory happens to have Drew's uh, contact number, would you be able to just uh, shoot him a text message? I know we have a quorum, but I would like all advisory members present before I actually call them. Um, call the meeting. I don't think I have it, but I'll take a look. Steve, I can shoot him a text if you want. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, and again, for those of you just joining, um, I have given you the ability to rename yourself. So if, you're, if your name is something random and you wanted it to be your actual name, you can feel free to do so. And I also ask that if you are um, here as a um, representative or in your capacity as a town employee or board or committee member and you wanted to include that in your name, you can feel, feel free to do so. I, I started labeling advisory members as advisory, but ran out of time here. All right, I see Drew is here. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, so all advisory members are now present. Um, this is the uh, public hearing for the 2021 Sherburne annual town meeting uh, warrant. We are discussing all of the articles of the warrant today. Um, I uh, need to call the meeting to order uh, as a roll call vote um, because of the uh, virtual nature. So can I get a, a motion from an advisory member to open the meeting? So moved. Second. Thank you, and a roll call vote now. Uh, Jane Matarazzo. Uh, Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basley. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. Thank you. It is 8.36 a.m. And so the meeting is uh, called to order um, as there isn't uh, really a um, an agenda. It is simply the only item is public hearing for the uh, warrant, so that will suffice as the reading of the um, agenda. Um, I would <clears throat> like to uh, explain some sort of uh, ground rules as we begin here. Um, so this is a public hearing. So um, it is we are primarily here to obtain uh, public comment on each of the articles and then to have advisory discussion. And then um, advisory will uh, make a motion and a vote as to whether we are recommending favorable action or no action on each of the articles of the warrant. Um, if you do not have a copy of the warrant, I do believe that um, it should be posted on the town website. Um, if not, I can also always ask um, David Williams uh, to uh, post it in the chat um, as a file that, that people can download. Um, so the way that um, the process is going to work is for uh, each warrant article, uh, I'm going to ask the sponsor or proponent of the article to make a uh, brief introductory presentation. Um, you may screen share if you like, it is not necessary, um, but uh, you will have the ability to screen share the uh, introductory um, 
presentation will be limited to five minutes and I am going to enforce that. I do have people who will be behind me. Um, and then following the uh, initial presentation, then I am going to invite public comments on the article. Um, comments will be limited to two minutes each. Um, again, that is going to be enforced. Um, and I would ask that in order, because of the number of people that are here, um, please use the raise hand feature of Zoom, um, which you should be able to see um, sort of in the toolbar at the bottom there. If you simply wave your hand in the video screen, it's uh, very, very likely that I'm not going to see you. Um, so please use the raise hand feature and wait to be recognized by the chair before you begin. Um, before you begin your comments, I ask that you identify yourself uh, with your name. If you are speaking as a private citizen, then I ask that you uh, state your street address within um, Sherburne. And then if you are speaking in a capacity as a town employee or a member of a committee or a board, that you um, uh, announce what committee or board or uh, department you are um, associated with. And then I ask that um, please do not make comments that are repetitive in nature. If somebody has said what you meant to say and you agree with them, um, then I simply ask that you uh, lower your hand and no longer you know, come up and just say, oh, I agree with what so-and-so said. Um, this, again, this is not the official town vote um, and this is not a uh, sort of a, a, a political um, uh, hearing. This is uh, for the purpose of advisory deciding whether or not uh, we recommend favorable action or no action. And generally speaking, advisory is mostly based on um, factual analysis and evidence and uh, us making a determination of whether we feel a particular article is um, good or not good for the town. Um, we are not overly concerned with um, how popular a particular thing is that will occur at the town vote. Um, you are the actual legislative body of the town. So you will vote it at town meeting and that's where, that's where the popularity comes in. Um, so again, please avoid repetitive things. Um, it does not really matter if five people support one thing and three people do not. Um, we just wanna know what the facts are. Um, with that, I believe that we, are, we will begin the public hearing. Um, typically, um, the chair will make some introductory comments and a presentation. I am going to mostly forego that in the interest of time. Um, I do want to mention that um, what, what advisory does, what we have been doing um, since essentially since January 1st is that we have been meeting on uh, a weekly basis with various departments and with all of the proponents of these articles to discuss them, to ask for alterations. Um, I know before I started on advisory, I had really no idea how this process worked and I had no idea what the advisory committee did. Um, so please be assured that this is not the first time that advisory is reviewing any of this information. And when we get to town meeting, certainly it is not the first time that people have been looking at the budgets and um, these articles. Um, so we've been working very diligently uh, for the past um, three plus months um, to get us where we are um, today. Um, all right, with that, I am going to uh, begin the public hearing on the 2021 annual town meeting warrant. Um, so article one uh, reports, uh, some of these articles I, that are short, I will probably read the uh, wording of the article um, and then ask for um, the proponent to uh, discuss. Um, so article one reports to hear and act on the reports of the various town officers and committees as contained in the annual town report or otherwise uh, presented. Um, this is the select board for the town administrator. Um, uh, David Williams, I don't know if you want to just give a, a, a quick explanation of, of what this article is. Um, basically, uh, it's a standard article, a routine article that's put in the warrant every year for um, reports to be heard from various committees. Sometimes the town um, takes a vote and just accepts the annual report, but um, there are no reports to vote on right now. Thank you very much. So again, this is uh, essentially routine business that allows for the town meeting to happen. Um, so I will open for public comment. Are there any public comments about Article 1? All 
right, last call for public comments. Hearing none, I am closing the public commentary and opening um, uh, advisor. Uh, sorry, I didn't finish going through the uh, process of how each of these is going to go. So after public comment, there will be advisory um, comment period, um, during which only advisory members will be allowed to speak. After the advisory comment period is closed, um, there will be a second public commentary period. Um, after that closes, um, we will open the voting session. Uh, the voting session will uh, consist of an advisory member making a motion on the article and then a second, um, at which point uh, there will be a second advisory discussion uh, prior to voting on the motion. Um, so I've just closed public comments. So now I am opening the advisory discussion. Um, does anybody from advisory have any comments on Article 1? All right, hearing none. Um, I'm closing advisory comment and opening the second public commentary period. Any additional public comments on Article 1? Right, hearing none. Uh, I'm closing the public commentary period and opening the voting session. Uh, can I get a motion from advisory on Article 1 reports? I move favorable action on Article 1. Great, we have a motion and a second for favorable action on Article 1. Um, any further advisory discussion? All right, hearing none, I'm going to call the vote. Uh, roll call vote. Jane Matarazzo. Stephen Leahy. Hi. Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> uh, Peter Galatano. Uh, you're muted, Peter. Hi. Brendan Daly. Hi. Wasim Basili. Hi. Natalie Weir. Hi. Mark Albers. Hi. Drew Cashel. Hi. I'm I as well. Motion passes 9-0. Moving on to Article 2. <clears throat> fiscal year 21, supplemental appropriations. Um, that is for the current fiscal year. Uh, this is to see if the town will vote to appraise an appropriate to raise an appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money. And if so, what sum for the purpose of supplementing the various line items of the town's fiscal year. 2021 budget previously voted by the town under Article 9 of the warrant for the 2020 annual town meeting or take any other action relative thereto. This is the select board for the town administrator and finance director. Um, so uh, can I ask uh, Deb Seifring, who is the interim finance director, um, can you just give us a summary of uh, the supplemental appropriations? Uh, yes, for um... Snow and ice, $134,200. The ambulance revolving fund, $95,000. The farm pond revolving fund, $15,000. And police overtime, $85,000 for a total of $329,200. Thank you. Um, so I would like to open up public comments on Article 2, the supplemental appropriations. All right, last call for public comments on Article 2. All right, seeing none, I'm closing public comments and opening up advisory comments. Um, does anybody from advisory have any comments on Article 2 supplemental appropriations? Hearing none, I'm closing uh, advisory commentary and reopening um, public commentary. Um, any additional public comments regarding Article 2, Supplemental Appropriations. All right, hearing none, I am closing uh, public commentary on Article 2 and opening the voting session. Can I get a motion from advisory regarding Article 2, the FY21 Supplemental Appropriations? So moved. And second. I believe you need to do you need to, I think in the motion, you need to state the amount, which was $329,200. I'll move favorable action that the um, amounts of supplementals that were 
just read by Deb Seifring, which is uh, for snow and ice, 134,200. For the ambulance revolving fund, 95,000. For farm ponds revolving, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, farm crime revolving fund 15,000 and for police overtime 85,000 for a total of $329,200. Uh, I move favorable action on those amounts. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, any advisory discussion on the motion on the table? Steve? Uh, yes, go ahead. Don't you need a funding source? Mm. Is this free cash? Uh, yes, thank you, Paul. Uh, I will amend um, my motion, thank you, Paul, to um, to say that these uh, amounts to be paid for without a free cash. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right, we have an amended motion. Um, can I get a second on the amended motion? Um, second. Great, um, so any advisory discussion on the motion on the table? Uh, hearing none, um, I would like to call the vote. Uh, Jane Matarazzo? Aye. Stephen Leahy? Aye. Peter Galatano? Aye. Brendan Daly? Wasim Basili? Aye. Natalie Weir? Aye. Mark Albers? Aye. Drew Cashel? Aye. And I'm at aye as well. The motion passes 9 0. All right, moving on to Article 3, which is the OPEB Trust Fund. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum for the purpose of funding the other post-employment benefits, aka OPEB Liability Trust Fund, or take any other action relative thereto. Uh, this is the select board for the treasurer. Um, does the treasurer have a recommended amount to transfer into the OPEB Trust Fund? Yes, good morning. I'd like to recommend the annual contribution of $100,000 from free cash to OPEB to can offset our lot continuing liability. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open up public commentary on Article 3 OPEB Trust Fund. Last call for public comments. All right, seeing none, uh, closing public comment and opening advisory comments. All right, hearing none, I'm closing advisory comment and reopening public comments. Any additional public comments? Right. Seeing none, I'm closing public commentary and opening the voting session. <clears throat> Can I get a motion from advisory relative to Article 3, OPEB Trust Fund? I'll do this one. Um, I move for favorable action on Article Number 3, uh, in which the Treasurer recommends an annual contribution amount of $100,000 from free cash. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I've got a motion and a second. Um, so any advisory discussion on the motion on the floor? All right. Hearing none, I would like to call the vote. Jane Matarazzo? Aye. Stephen Leahy? Aye. Peter Galatano? Aye. Brendan Daly? Aye. Basim Basili? Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Motion passes 9 0. All right. Moving on to Article 4 pre modernization bond premiums. To see if the town will vote to supplement each prior vote of the town that authorizes the borrowing of money to pay costs of capital projects to provide that in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44, Section 20, the premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes thereunder, lest any such premium applied to the payments of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes, 
may be applied to pay project costs and the amount authorized to be borrowed for each such project shall be reduced by the amount of any such premium so applied or take any other action relative thereto. This is select board for the town treasurer. Uh, does the treasurer have a quick explanation of article four? Yes, this is uh, again routine language that allows the town for bonds issued before 2016, which we have a 2013 and 2015 still outstanding for their premiums to be applied um, as listed. So recommendation is to approve. Thank you. I would like to open public commentary on article four, pre-modernization bond premiums. Last call for public comments. Seeing none, I'm closing public comments and opening advisory comments. Any advisory comments on Article 4? I have a question, um, and I think Heidi, maybe you're the right person to direct this to. But I'm, uh, what are we talking about in terms of a bond premium? Like, I, I guess I'm surprised that, there, that the town would receive a bond premium on a market issue of bonds, right? Don't, like, aren't they issued at their face value? So. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So when you do a bond, there are some bonds where you get a premium amount in your bond. And they'll say, like, say we took a $3 million bond out and we had 300000 in premiums. You have to amortize that amount every year over the period of the bond. You just don't take the 300 off the first year. So the 2013-15 bonds had some premiums that are issued. So every year there's a certain amount and it's probably under $5,000 at this point. But we okay. have to vote to reissue it allow that amount to be accounted for each year to go against the bond and those articles that were uh, given the premiums. So it's an accounting issue more so than anything. You know, we're given the money, but we have to account uh, on the books to put this over the 10 years or 15 or 20 years life of the bond. Okay. So just to make sure I'm understanding. So the, um, uh, any premium that we receive on an issue is eventually being applied to whatever it is that we're bonding out. It's just currently being amortized over the lifetime of the note. Now we're going to be able to account for it all at once. Right. And actually, we've been doing this traditionally each year, um, but it had not been labeled as the pre-modernization bond premium before. So this is the first time saying pre-modernization act, because once we've paid off the 2013 and 2015 bonds, this article doesn't need to be anymore because each article going forward after 2016 has it within the voting language. When you do your capital votes, you see the same language. Okay, so perfect. You answered my next question as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional advisory commentary on Article 4? Uh, hearing none, I would like to reopen public comments. Any additional public comments on Article 4, pre modernization bonds premiums? All right, seeing none, I'm closing public commentary and opening the voting session. <clears throat> Can I get a motion from advisory relative to Article 4, pre-modernization bond premiums? I move favorable action on Article 4. Can I get a second? Second. All right, there is a motion and a second. Uh, I Any advisory discussion regarding the motion on the table. All right, hearing none, I would like to call the vote. Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Steve Leahy. Steve. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basili. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. I'm also an aye. Motion passes 9 0. <clears throat> All right, moving on to Article 5 improvement. I'm sorry, I scrolled too far. Improvement embellishment of cemeteries. To see if the town will vote to appraise and appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum to be used pursuant to MGL Chapter 14, Section 15 for the improvement or embellishment of the cemeteries throughout the town. 
for the care, preservation, or embellishment of any lot or its appurtenances therein, or take any other action relative there, thereto. This is the select board for the cemetery commission. Um, I do believe um, Chucky Blaney is here, um, but, but I believe that Deb Sebring also had to look into this uh, late. Um, but if either of you wants to speak to um, the amount going into the um, cemetery embellishment. Uh, yes, I just looked into it this morning, and um, so far, year to date, there's been $9,450 um, deposited into the Cemetery Enlargement Fund. So based on that, I would like to uh, propose to move $10,000. Thank you. Uh, Chucky, does that, do you agree with that? Uh, we, it's whatever it is. We don't, we don't have any control over it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's Even? just, yes. Basically, the, the, they take the number that is uh, from cemetery lot sales, and then it's all transferred into the enlargement fund. That's, that's what this does. Right. Yep. It depends how many lots we sell in a given year. All right. Thank you. Um, I would like to open up public commentary on Article 5, Improvement Embellishment of Cemeteries. I'd just like to say thank you, Deb, for doing that. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Deb, for everything you've been doing for the past month. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> um, all right, second call for public comments on Article 5, Cemetery Embellishment. Seeing none, I would like to close public comments and open up uh, advisory comments. Right, hearing no advisory comments, I would like to reopen public comments. Any additional public comments on Article 5, Cemetery Embellishment? All right, seeing none, I'm closing public commentary and opening the voting session. Uh, can I get a motion from advisory relative to Article 5, Improvement and Embellishment of Cemeteries? I move to transfer an amount of $10,000 from the town's general fund to the cemetery fund for embellishment and improvement i believe it's called the cemetery enlargement fund is that right cemetery enlargement fund thank you can i get a second second all right there is a motion and a second on the table uh can i get any advisory discussion on the motion hearing none i'd like to call the vote jane matarazzo Aye. Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Bosley. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. And I'm aye as well. The motion passes 9-0. All right, moving on to Article 6, which is the revolving funds. <clears throat> uh, to see if the town will vote to set the fiscal year 2022 spending limit for each of the revolving funds set forth in Chapter 28 of the General Bylaws, pursuant to the provisions of NGL Chapter 44, Section 53E and one half, or take any other action relative thereto. Um, this is the select board for the finance director. Um, because the revolving fund limits are in the warrant, I'm just going to read them out so that uh, Deb doesn't have to. Um, so the limits uh, in the warrant for the revolving funds are Council on Aging, uh, 75,000, Board of Health Flu Clinic, 20,000, Recycling Committee Sale of Bins, $1,065, Town Forest Sale of Firewood, $35,000. Farm Pond, $160,000. Ambulance, $375,000. Elder Housing, $351,109. Recreation, $250,000. DPW Fire and Police Surplus Equipment, $50,000 for a total of $1,317,174. Um, Deb, do you have anything additional to add to that? No, I don't. 
Thank you. Uh, so then I would like to open public commentary on Article 6, Revolving Funds. Last call for public comments on Article 6. It's seeing none, um, closing public comments and opening up advisory comments on Article 6, Revolving Funds. All right, hearing none, I'm closing advisory comments and reopening public comments. All right, seeing none, I am closing public commentary for Article 6, Revolving Funds and opening the voting session. Can I get a motion from advisory relative to Article 6, Revolving Funds? Sir, I'll move that uh, town vote to take favorable action on Article 6, which is the um, fiscal year 2022 spending limit for each of the revolving funds that total $1,317,174. Second. Thank you. I've got a motion and a second on the floor. Um, can I get any advisory discussion on the motion? All right. Hearing none, I'd like to call the vote. Jane Matarazzo. Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basili. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. And I'm aye as well. The motion passes 9-0. All right. Uh, moving on to Article 7, uh, Stabilization Funds. Uh, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds, a sum of money, and if so, what sum to stabilization funds or take any other action relative thereto. This is the select board for the advisory committee. Um, but I'm going to ask, if possible, Deb Seifring, if you have the total amounts for the stabilization funds. I really don't. Uh, all right, sorry. I believe I have it here somewhere. Steve, I, I think it was 324,185 um, plus an additional 50,000. I, I can confirm it is the three, $324,185, but I believe it was 80,000, was it not, David? I'm I looking at I think I think that's advisory's additional recommendation, and I I think we had talked about fifty thousand. Steve, am I correct about right. that? That that is what I remember was fifty thousand. Right, you had taken out um, the amount. Um, yes, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just uh, as an explanation for um, the public, the general stabilization fund is a sort of so-called rainy day fund, um, which uh, you know is set aside for emergency spending that was sort of uh, un unanticipated. Um, a few years ago, there was uh, a lot of tree damage from uh, Gypsy, well, there, there still is a lot of tree damage, but it was fairly emergent that we take care of it. And I believe we had transferred uh, $150,000 out of general stabilization um, for tree work. Um, so that is an example of what it is used for. Um, disbursement of funds from general stabilization requires a town meeting vote. Um, so it isn't just money that anybody can use whenever um, the town has to agree to use it. Um, and so that was, um, that was, I believe that was two years ago um, that we did that with the general stabilization fund and we've been slowly paying it back. And as good fiscal management, we typically will try to put a little bit of money into stabilization every year. Um, that first amount, 324185 was um, a special amount that was used to pay um, uh, the supplemental appropriations from last year's town meeting uh, because of the timing related to the uh, COVID pandemic. Our town meeting last year occurred after the beginning of the fiscal year, so we were not able to use free cash as we typically would. So we used general stabilization fund money, uh, which was uh, authorized uh, due to uh, the governor's emergency order. 
um, and we're simply replenishing that back into the general stabilization fund. So um, after this town meeting vote, um, the, the books will have been balanced. Essentially, we took three twenty four. $324,000 out last year, and we're just putting it back in from free cash. Um, so that's just a quick explanation of what that is. Um, great. So now can I get any public comments on uh, the general, the stabilization funds? Steven, this is Jeff. Uh, do we know what the balance is in the stabilization fund after this transfer? Uh, that's a good question. Deb, do you do you happen to have that the, the balance? If you, don't, if you don't have it handy, it's okay. I'm just curious. I, I don't have it handy, but I will get it to you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comments? Right. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to close public comments and open advisory comments. Any advisory comments on Article 7 stabilization funds? Just a clarification, Steve, this is a free cash because the 324 came out of free cash, I believe, and we're just putting it back. Yes. Yes. So this will be a free cash transfer. So just whoever makes the motion, make sure that you indicate that in your motion. Any additional advisory comments? All right. Closing advisory comment and reopening public comments. Any additional public comments on Article 7 stabiliz stabilization funds? Seeing none, uh, closing public commentary and opening the voting session. Can I get a motion uh, relative to Article 7 stabilization funds? And for reference, the total amount will be $374,185. Uh, I move favorable action on Article 7 with regard to stabilization funds and the total amount of $374,185. You should state where that's coming from also. Oh, sorry, from, from free cash to our stabilization fund. Can I get a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Can I get any advisory discussion on the motion on the table? All right, hearing none, I'd like to call the vote. Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basili. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cashel. Aye. No, I'm aye as well. That is nine zero. All right. Moving on to Article Eight, which is the omnibus budget. <clears throat> to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds such sums of money for any and all town expenses and purposes, including debt and interest, and to provide for a reserve fund, and to fix the salaries and compensation of all elected officers of the town as required by MGL Chapter 41, Section 108, and to determine whether such salaries or compensation shall be made effective from July 1st of the current year and to provide for the payment of and raise or appropriate money for any salary and compensation so voted, or to take any other action relative thereto. This is the select board for the advisory committee. Now, typically the way that the omnibus budget works is that um, I will go through and uh, read out the total operating budgets uh, proposed for each of the town departments um, for, the, um, for the omnibus budget. Uh, advisory members uh, typically can call a hold on any individual budget. Um, at the end of uh, reading the budget lines, then I will call, um, we'll have discussion and then call a vote on all of the non-held budget items, um, which will be collectively voted on. Then any budgets that were held um, will then be discussed um, individually. Um, with individual public comments and an individual vote, uh, vote from uh, advisory. Uh, now I'm gonna do something a little bit um, different this year uh, in the 
interest, well, I guess it's not really different, uh, but in the interest of time and expedience, because I believe there are several articles in this year's warrant that will have lengthy discussion. Um, the omnibus budget is uh, in pretty good shape in the opinion of advisory. Um, I don't believe that there are any individual budgets uh, that we um, take issue with. Again, I want to point out that we have been working um, very hard since July, uh, since um, January 1st, which is when budgets were um, uh, due from all the departments. Um, and I do, I want to kind of call out a few uh, numbers here. So advisory's guidance on um, the budget for the town was level funding uh, relative to the fiscal 21 budget relative to last year's budget or the current year's budget, um, as well as 2% cost of living adjustment as recommended by the personnel board. Um, so relative to advisory's guidance, um, collectively all of the town's uh, budgetary, uh, sorry, departmental budgets are only 1% over uh, advisory guidance, which I believe is is really excellent. Um, that indicates that you know they've the budget makers have done a very good job keeping their spending in check. Um, and advisory has been working diligently. That is actually a reduction of five hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars relative to the initial budgetary request. So please rest assured that we did not just look at everybody's budget and then just kind of sign off on it. We've been working very hard um, to reduce the budget. Um, as a sort of um, comparison, um, let me, this is somewhat informal poll of, there were uh, 21 uh, nearby towns um, in the sort of Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and on average, their operating uh, budgets increased by 3.44% uh, relative to fiscal 21. Um, the town of Sherborne's budget increase over fiscal 21, this is not over guidance, but over the actual budget is 2.46%, which within these uh, 21 towns was the uh, third lowest. So um, I want to assure you that it is of utmost importance to advisory that all of these budgets are running as lean as possible without compromising the service and public safety being provided um, to the town. So one of the things that I'm gonna do that's a little bit different, um, I am going to read everything out, but I also do want to, there are a few budgets that are somewhat over guidance. Um, we have met with all of these um, departments and uh, we've adjusted as necessary. We've heard their justifications. These have all been in open meetings. Um, so the you know public was available to comment as needed. But I do wanna call out a few of the um, departments um, and just explain what their increases are um, just so that anybody who is here and interested uh, in the omnibus budget from the public um, has an explanation. Um, so the select board uh, has increased by 10%, and that is primarily due to the uh, creation of a new uh, IT or information technology uh, department where we're trying to sort of collect um, the uh, generic IT expenses from the various town uh, departments and consolidate them into one. And we decided to create that um, department within the select board. So that's a new, uh, that's a new um, budget account within the select board. So that's the reason that's gone up. The assessors have gone up by 9.5%. Um, and the reason uh, for that is a uh, revaluation certification, which is uh, required by the state. Um, it is uh, on a five-year cycle and there is a cost associated with that. Initially, the assessor had placed this as its own warrant article. Advisory decided that this is something, it wasn't really an option to not do it. It's mandated by the state, it's required. So, and it's ongoing. So we decided to just build that into the assessor's budget. Um, so that accounts for um, the increase there. Fire and rescue has gone up by 16.99%. Um, that is due to the full-time uh, lieutenant uh, position, uh, which was a grant funded uh, position beginning, I believe it was three years ago. Um, and we knew that it was a, a seed money grant um, from the state. Um, so that position, although it's been there for three years, the town has not had to pay for it, but uh, 
the seed money runs out and now it becomes the town's responsibility to cover that position. Uh, that position the, was initially filled by uh, Zach Ward who subsequently became our interim chief and then our permanent chief. Um, and uh, so this is uh, a position that we knew about and we were expecting uh, and the increase is due to the fact that um, now the town is paying for that salary rather than it being grant funded. The building inspectors have gone up by 10.48% and that is due to um, adopting a uh, electronic um, filing system for uh, permitting um, as opposed to doing uh, paper uh, permitting, which is archaic. Um, and so that, that is due to the, the cost associated with the electronic permitting system, which furthermore um, has the ability to scale out and be potentially applicable to several other departments within town besides the um, uh, besides the inspectors. Um, so we're hoping that there will be some, some version of economy of scale there. Um, and then let's see, the Department of Public Works has gone up by 6.39%. Um, it is, as you can imagine, DPW is complicated. And so there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, the general categories tended to fall under um, sort of equipment. So basically, you know, Director Colleen requires a certain amount of uh, equipment to do his job, and um, he has needed more money than he has been getting from the town in the past. Um, there is also uh, roadway management work, um, storm drainage. Um, there is increased contractual services. Um, I believe a lot of that has to do with the um, tree work uh, that is being done around town, which of course is a public safety issue. Um, and then uh, increased police details due to all of the um, uh, projects. Um, so that is the DPW. Um, the library has gone up by 8.42%. That is essentially due to the fact that um, the library, we have a reasonable expectation, should be open and operational. The, that is the new library building should be open and operational in the uh, fiscal year 22. And so the library's budget has been <clears throat> cut for the past several years uh, due to the fact that there was not an operational library um, in the new building. And so obviously there is a new larger building and it's going to cost money to run it um, and staff it. Um, and so those are the, those are the major <clears throat> departments. Um, again, we've had many discussions with all of them and uh, advisory I believe is satisfied um, with each of those uh, budgets. Um, and now I'm going to go through and <clears throat> read um, department by department the fiscal year 22 department request for their operating budgets. So beginning in the category of general government, um, we have the select board uh, in the amount of $403,281. Legal counsel in the amount of $80,000. Assessors in the amount of $153,954. The treasurer in the amount of $94,409. Collector in the amount of $153,346. The finance director and accounting department in the amount of $305,649. The advisory committee in the amount of $4,013. Conservation Commission in the amount of $68,835. Planning Board in the amount of $52,227. The Town Clerk in the amount of $152,013. Election and Registration in the amount of $22,887. Town Buildings in the amount of $315,684 for a general government total of $1,806,298. In the category of protection of life and property, the police department in the amount of $2,138,382. Fire and rescue in the amount of $539,098. Ambulance in the amount of $190,000. Inspectors in the amount of $108,486. The total for protection of life and property is $2,975,966. 
in the category of schools, we have the Dover Sherburn Regional School District assessment for Sherburn is $10,205,111. Tri-County Vocational in the amount of $34,967. The Sherburn Schools total in the amount of $7,000,000. $1,886. Uh, no amount for the Norfolk Agricultural uh, and Minuteman, that is zero. And the total for the schools is $17,241,964. In the category of public works, we have the Department of Public Works in the amount of $1,155,044. Snow and ice in the amount of $86,110. Street lighting in the amount of uh, $26,000. Solid waste in the amount of $336,875. Recycling in the amount of $3,230. Cemeteries in the amount of uh, $75,500. The public works total is $1,682,759. In the category of health and human services, the Board of Health in the amount of one, uh, sorry, $147,940. Council on Aging in the amount of $165,657. Uh, veterans in the amount of $6,490. The total for Health and Human Services is $320,087. In the category of Culture and Recreation, the library is $564,735. Uh, recreation, $15,000. The Historical Commission is $1,300. The total for culture and recreation is $581,035. In the category of insurance and employee benefits, uh, general insurance is $171,279. Employee benefits, including OPEB and retirement, is $2,970,208. Uh, in the category of debt service, the total is $1,486,408. And then the reserve account uh, is in the amount of $300,000. The grand total for the omnibus budget is $29,000,000. $536,014. Uh, so I would now like to open up uh, for public comments regarding the omnibus budget. Last call for public comments regarding the omnibus budget. All right, I'm closing public commentary and opening uh, advisory comments. Steve, I, I'd just like to recognize the town employees diligent and collaborative effort towards crafting this 2022 budget. Your concise summary that took, you know, three to four minutes um, doesn't really illustrate the months of work over the holidays through the winter and into the spring that took to get the results of that moderate, moderate increase of 2.4, which is reasonable and, and um, modest, is a culmination of their collective efforts. So uh, I would like to express thanks and gratitude for those town budget makers for all of their efforts on behalf of myself and I would go as far as the entire advisory committee. Well put, Peter, I agree completely. Thank you to everyone in the town departments for 
working diligently to work on the budgets. Thank you. And, and I, I would like to add also as a somewhat um, sort of philosophical comment about um, uh, budgets and how they relate to the, the, the tax rate, which I think is, you know, of, <clears throat> of, of central importance to everybody in town, um, you know, from the, the 40,000 foot view, you know, the tax rate is basically set by two numbers, you know, on above, you've got the numerator, which is essentially how much money did you spend? And then um, on the bottom, you've got the denominator, which is what is the total value of um, the town? Um, and any other additional revenues. Um, so what we're talking about here is essentially the numerator. This is uh, the spending of the town. Um, I think a lot of people have opinions about um, how to uh, keep the tax rate steady or lower. Um, a lot of people focus on, we have to um, rein in spending, decrease spending, um, and that's true. Um, and I believe that this fairly modest, fairly small increase um, and the amount of time that we've all put in over the past um, several months represents our best effort at reining in spending and trying to keep it as lean as possible. Um, but we, we, we must recognize the fact that the denominator has um, probably a much larger, well, maybe not much larger, but a very significant effect on the tax rate. And the denominator set by the value of your homes and the number of homes as well as the presence and value of any sort of non-residential real property that is in town. Um, so it, it is a thing to keep in mind that this is something that I know Steve Leahy, the chair before me has mentioned and that I um, said last year, um, if we do not increase the number of tax paying entities in town, then it is unavoidable that everybody's tax bill is going to go up every single year. Uh, because it's simply going to cost more money year after year to run a town just by simple inflation, right? We, there's a cost of living increase for the employees. There are uh, collective bargaining agreements that also set uh, uh, increases in salary. And then the cost of doing all of the things is going, it's going to cost more to buy equipment and materials and pay for utilities and to pay for contractors. It's all going to go up. So if we don't increase the number of tax paying entities, everybody's tax bills will go up every year. Um, so we need to try to keep that in mind and consider um, both how we can keep the numerator in check, but also to expand the denominator. Um, but this numerator is where uh, advisory spends most of our time. And I believe we've done a, a pretty good job of keeping this down. Any additional advisory comments regarding the omnibus budget? All right, I'd like to reopen the floor for public comments on the omnibus budget. Right, this is, uh, oh. um, Trainer, can I ask a quick question? Um, yes, can you identify yourself and uh, yep. your address? Tom Trainer, uh, 97 Washington Street. I, I just noticed that your nice reading of the summaries of, of the budget that the, the town's, I guess, current debt service uh, comes to a cost of about 1.4 million a year. Was that correct? Uh, yes, it is uh, 1.486. Thank you. And, and the question I was just, uh, how much debt does the town hold right now? Um, I, Heidi, Heidi Doyle, the town treasurer is, is in the media. I don't know if, if you have a, if you have that number handy. Sure, um, it's going to be a question of the last issue. So the the debt service is running um, about the average amount. We're running between 1.3 and 1.6 million per year. Our current debt uh, on the last one is um, active was around oh. seven million, and then we're getting a new issue. It's coming up. I, I'd so be happy to send you more information if you want an in depth list of what the exact borrowings are or oh that would be very nice thank you that answers the question thank sure. you sure if you'd like if you'd like to reach out to me i'd be happy to email you and get you the detailed list for that thank you sure. 
and again, it's fine, Tom, that you sort of called out, but I just ask that <clears throat> for public commenters, can you please use the raise hand feature to be recognized by the chair? Um, it's not a big deal so far, but I believe that the next article is going to have a lot of people who will want to say things. So again, please use the raise hand feature of Zoom. Uh, any additional public comments regarding the omnibus budget? Right, seeing none, I'm closing public comments on the omnibus budget um, and uh, was that the second round of, yes, that was the second round of comments, right, for public. Uh, so I'd like to open the voting session. Um, again, we are now voting on the entire omnibus budget as read, uh, um, as we did not hold any budgets. So can I get a motion from advisory uh, with respect to article eight, the fiscal year 22 omnibus budget? Move favorable action on the amounts specified uh, in the town accountants report of departmental budget requests as affirmed through discussions with the advisory committee on the omnibus budget. Can I get a second? Mm -hmm. All right, there is a motion and a second on the table. Uh, can I get any advisory discussion regarding the motion on article eight? Right, hearing none, I'd like to call the vote. Uh, Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Vasily. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Cushell. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Steve, right. uh, I think I think that we can check with the select board. It might be appropriate for the select board to take this same vote on the entire omnibus budget. Oh yes, does Good that point. make sense? Yes, thank we, you. Jeff. We had voted on the individual items underneath the select board, but not on the omnibus as a whole, from what I understand. Um, yes, and I think it could accelerate town meeting if we've already voted on uh, okay. accepting the overall omnibus as opposed to having to go through each one. Does that make sense, Paul? Yes, I agree. And I move to that the Board of Selectmen, the select board approve the omnibus budget as just read. Well, it's, right. it's approved, but support, Paul. I would say it's support. We don't support. Take favorable action or whatever. I second uh, his, his motion. OK, all in favor, uh, George. Aye. Uh, Jeff. Aye. Uh, Paul? Aye. I am I as well. Okay, we move on 400 to support the omnibus budget. All right, thank you, Eric. Okay, moving on to <clears throat> Article 9, should be a quick one. Um, actually, we got to this one a bit earlier than I was expecting, so we've done a good job. Article 9, authorization for design and construction turf field at Laurel Farm to see if the town will vote to appropriate, borrow, or transfer from available funds a sum of money, and if so, what sum to be expended under the direction of the Recreation Commission for the design and construction of a new unlighted turf athletic field at Laurel Farm contingent upon at least $3 million first being raised through certain private donations for the said purpose and also to establish a stabilization fund under the Recreation Commission to be funded through the use of field fees and private donations for the purpose of repairing, resurfacing, or replacing the said field, or take any other action relative thereto. This is the Select Board for the Recreation Commission. And is Dave Goldberg or anyone from the Recreation Commission here to, to do a presentation? Yeah, I'm here. I think Eric had his hand up before you started too, Steve. It's oh, just sorry. It's just to report our vote. I don't know when you want our, our vote reported uh, before presentations, after, during public comment. Uh, what's your preference? Um, I would probably say, um, well, well, I think it's probably reasonable for you to wait and hear all of the discussion. Um, so probably uh, before the 
the advisory vote. So I'd say after the second round of public comments, maybe I'll let you, um, I'll let the select board um, take a vote. Does that sound good, Eric? What we did vote is it to report the vote, report the results of the vote. We voted on April 1st on this. Oh, that's right. You did already report it. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Yes, you can go ahead and report your vote now. Okay, so on April 1st, the select board voted uh, three in favor, one against, zero abstains to support this article. So. All right, go ahead, Dave. You got five minutes. That's yeah, sure. So uh, I'm going to start just by talking about uh, the overall project, our objective with the project, and, and some of the outcomes we expect. And uh, I'm going to leave hopefully a minute or so for Gavin Mish to talk about some of the um, concerns that we've heard from the town and, and try and address some of those uh, preemptively. Um, essentially, the objective for the project was uh, we know that the surface over at Laurel uh, is in dire need of, uh, <laughs> of an upgrade. Um, if you've been down there, they're wavy, they're, the, the, the grass surfaces don't play well, um, and our kids essentially are getting used to playing on, um, on artificial surfaces that, that uh, play better. Um, and we also have issues like right now where we're waiting for grass to germinate and we can't use the, we can't use the fields or we have to limit the use of the fields so, this, so that the project extends the playing system, uh, playing season for the kids. Um, part of the project is to improve the parking over there at Laurel. Um, and one of the overarching uh, objectives is to make sure that this doesn't cost the taxpayers of the town of Sherburn, uh, the town itself, or any of the youth sports additional costs. So we plan to fund it entirely um, through the use of leasing the fields. Um, ideally, there'll be additional revenue left over at the end of the at the end of any year that we can use towards other recreation projects. The idea is to have one continuous synthetic field uh, located in northeast side of the facility. Um, it will be multi-sport, so soccer, lacrosse, we can play pretty much any sport on it. Uh, it will play in both directions. Uh, the idea is also to add some more parking down there. We know right now that there's, there's insufficient parking even for the fields we have. Um, there'll be some equipment as well as a maintenance shed down there, um, as well as uh, you know, we'll use some of the infill that we remove to, uh, to try and grade some of the natural grass fields as well. Uh, just a rendering of, of where we anticipate the, uh, the fields to go. Uh, keep in mind, this is not two separate fields, but a single continuous field um, that can play either way. But you can see right now it's lined for soccer in, in one given direction. Uh, you can also see the uh, parking improvements there uh, where we've got uh, a much better flow of traffic, a turnaround for cars at, at the end. Uh, our, we anticipate the, the project to cost approximately $4 million. Um, we plan on raising, as, you, as uh, you mentioned in the article, $3 million from private donors and seeking a $1 million to be borrowed from the town. Our anticipation is that we will easily be able to pay, pay back the, the debt service on that bond each year. So there should be no... Um, there should be no money that has to come from the town in order to pay it off. Uh, we've done this extensive analysis, talking to other towns, looking at the total number of hours, the cost per field. Uh, and we think that we have plenty of revenue coming in um, in order to not only pay off the bond of 150,000 per year, but also to make sure that we've got money for a field replacement at the end of its useful lifetime. Um, so we anticipate about 10 years is, is the lifetime of this field. We need to make sure we put money aside for that. So even though it looks, the 324,000 looks like a lot of money, um, the majority of it will go towards debt service um, and also for field replacement. I should mention that the town money, if we raise the 4 million, or excuse me, if we raise the 3 million, the town money will be the last money that's spent. So we'll raise, we'll spend the private donor money first because um, a lot of that 4 million, I would say about 700,000 is contingencies. So there's a good chance that um, a significant portion or, or, or maybe none of the town money is act, will actually be needed at the end of the project. So in summary, um, the idea here is to uh, improve playing for our, for our kids, um, improve the parking over there, uh, make sure that there's zero cost to the, to the town, um, and also ideally uh, uh, tackle some of the uh, deferred maintenance here in town, like the, the tennis course um, fences and, and potentially uh, kick off new projects, um, you know, under, you know, uh, uh, from recreation. Gavin, I don't know if you want to, you have 45 seconds. <laughs> I'll try and be quick here. Uh, one of the concerns we have is uh, turf being wasteful. We've done a lot of research on that and found that 
these materials would otherwise be in a landfill if they were not being used for a turf field. So we're actually extending the life of some of these materials. And there are options for recycling uh, that not only are existing in other locations, but uh, by the time we need to recycle in 10 years should be well underway in the US in regards to recycling options. Uh, there are options for reusability of these fields also, so they do not end up in a landfill and, uh, REC is able to actually cover any costs that could be associated with that. Uh, regards to risks uh, of toxins or pellets or groundwater contamination, we've done a ton of research on that as well. Uh, both the uh, Massachusetts government and the EPA have reports where they specifically say that uh, turf fields are low risk. Uh, aside from that, we've also spoken with uh, Ron Myrick, who was a Dover resident and the vice president of Tetra Tech. They did testing of PFAs. Gavin, your, your time is up, Gavin. <clears throat> Sorry, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions from the public, so you can respond to the questions as they happen. Thank you. Um, sure. We do, um, uh, before opening public comment, I do believe that two of our town uh, boards, the Board of Health and the Conservation Commission, um, have composed uh, uh, statements regarding this article. So I would first like to um, invite representatives from the Board of Health. I do see Daryl Beardsley here, and then also uh, Conservation Commission. I believe Carol McGarry was going to be here. I see a, a Carol, but I'm not sure if that's the Carol. <laughs> um, but if uh, uh, if either of you is uh, ready, I guess, um, Daryl, I don't know if you, do you want to go first? Sure, I'd be happy to. Just a quick question, since I don't want to speed read so much that what I say is unintelligible. Um, but I assume that if people want to ask questions on anything that I very briefly touch on, that is summarizing the very robust two-hour discussion that the Board of Health had the other night, then... I would be more than happy to dive into uh, further information. Uh, yes, for sure. I think if somebody asks a question that is clearly best answered by um, somebody from one of the town uh, boards, then I, I will direct the question to you. I would just ask that you be reasonable in the length of your response. Um, okay. All right. All right, so as I said, first I'm going to read what the uh, statement is from the Sherborne Board of Health. Regarding player injury, including concussion, lower extremity musculoskeletal injury and abrasion, there is insufficient evidence to support a benefit of either natural or artificial turf over the alternative. As a result, these considerations should not materially impact the choice of turf from a public health standpoint. Regarding impact on ground and surface water, there is evidence that compounds contained in artificial turf can have toxic effects. These compounds can enter ground and surface water from an artificial field, but the concentrations reached and impact on water quality and public health cannot be quantified at this time. Uh, regarding the physical health comment, I'll just note that, of course, if new evidence becomes available, then that this should be revisited. So the board noted a lack of consensus across numerous studies reflecting how difficult it is to track and correlate factors that may be influential to the physical health of the players. Uh, age, skill level, dynamics of the particular sport, field condition specific, sample sizes, quirks of fate that result in injury, et cetera. Uh, so there's not a, a clear answer in either direction, especially for a field with a wide range of uses that are planned for these fields. We were silent on heat because the board noted that is such an obvious condition that good judgment is expected to be applied. And even with alternative infills, the maximum temperatures of 150 degrees can be expected. On chemical impacts, uh, our evaluation was a bit limited by the uncertainty of the project's design specifics, particularly with respect to material options. And we suggest that this should be open to further discussion. I'll also note that this is uh, such a complex topic that there are a number of entities uh, including the town of Sharon, Massachusetts, and the Children's Environmental Health Center at Mount Sinai Hospital that are declaring or recommending moratoriums on such fields until the issues might be resolved. 
with respect to the EPA's preliminary uh, 2019 report on artificial turf that has often been referred to as generally indicating things as safe. That's not the whole story of what the study says, and it is only partway through the study. Um, and then what's gaining increasing attention now is the synthetic grass and grass backing portion of field construction for reasons of understudied aspects, especially additives such as PFAS compounds. And I'll stop there. And again, I'm happy to go into details on any of those things I briefly touched on. Thank you. Um, Carol? Uh, you're muted, Carol. Hang on, let me. Hey, you're good, Carol. Okay, thank you. I'm Carol McGarry. I'm speaking for Conservation Commission. Um, so I'm going to read our statement. Impacts to wetlands are a concern of and regulated by the Sherburne Conservation Commission. Laurel Farm is in the buffer zone of wetlands on the north and east sides of the fields, and there might be wetlands within the fields itself. Wetlands have essential functions recognized and protected by state and local law, specifically including quality of water supplies, quality of groundwater, prevention of pollution, wildlife habitat, and wildlife. Wetlands act like sponges and play an invaluable role in storing surface water and runoff, filtering it and retaining it while it percolates and contributes to groundwater supply. Here in Sherburn, our groundwater and aquifers are the source of the water we rely on in our daily lives, and the wetlands at Laurel Fields overlay an important aquifer. Wetlands maintain and improve water quality by trapping nutrients, sediments, and contaminants, but this capacity has limits. More research is needed on the impact of chemical dispersal from artificial turf on wetland health and functions. Many studies show that a wide range of hazardous materials make up artificial turf and its constituents, such as infill backing and blades, even the newer designs. This includes PFAS, which is increasingly being flagged as a drinking water contaminant at very low levels. There are also other toxic organic compounds and metals as part of hundreds of tons of synthetic polymers and other materials. The commission is concerned about the introduction of hazardous materials that could co contaminate wetlands and interconnected groundwater, as well as a nearby brook with broader connections. Because of the risk, a number of other nearby towns have decided against artificial fields or have delayed consideration in order to learn more about the health and environmental impacts of artificial turf. For Sherburn, questions will include what specific materials are going to be included in the project and how much and to what extent will the toxic materials move via water and air. Therefore, the commission recommends at a minimum further study of artificial turf, <coughs> excuse me, while also, more importantly, considering alternatives with lower environmental impacts, such as natural fields that are mostly or totally organically managed and have been implemented elsewhere. For these reasons, the Commission recommends no action on this Warren article. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, all right, and I'm going to open for the rest of public comment now. I see Chris Brown has had his hand up for a bit. Go ahead, Chris, and please identify yourself, and you have two minutes. My, uh, thank you, Steve. Chris Brown, 14 Rockwood Street. Um, I, I'm an abutter to Laurel Farm, and I tripped over this uh, just a few days ago, but purely by accident. Uh, Laurel's issues have, are not new. There's something that's been going for at least 20, 25 years, back in the time when I was a member of advisory, including I did spend a year as chair, Steve. Um, there, you know, there's never been a town project in the history that I'm aware of where borrowing authority has been sought by, uh, by, a, by any committee before a com complete feasibility study has been made. There were many feasibility studies done 20, 25 years ago. Mike Guthrie, uh, Leo Kavanagh, et cetera. We did a lot of work on those issues. Um, but we, the abutters back then were strongly against the proposals there uh, and yeah, we're very, there's the ones that I have been able to speak to are very upset that something has happened without any consultation with us. Um, my ask for advisory today, because this is only literally, I had the first conversation with recreation yesterday. Um, 
come up right now is that you either place a hold on your vote or you make a vote that goes to town meeting to take no action. Um, I just don't think anybody is ready for to authorize a borrowing of an unknown project of a scope, engineering, need, consequences, as uh, both the Conservation and Board of Health have uh, indicated to. Uh, I want to thank you there so I can retain any time for future comments. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, next we have Tom Trainer. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Tom Trainer, 97 Washington Street. Uh, I'd like to share a few concerns I have about this uh, $1 million bonding, quest, uh, bonding request. I find it interesting that uh, the town, that's why I asked my earlier question, and I apologize, Steve, not following your, uh, your rules on raising hands. Uh, uh, the town has a current, uh, apparently, uh, exposure of seven million. I, I really don't advise uh, adding to that 15% for, for this one million. For many of the concerns that were just brought up to you by the previous three speakers, and I'm also very concerned, and I'm going to focus uh, the rest of my time on financial issues. I share all the environmental concerns. I'm on three uh, town committees that uh, kind of focus on environmental things, and none of those three committees have been uh, appraised to this project. I don't see the, the need for the, uh, for the rush uh, to uh, uh, try, try to get it started without more uh, review. Uh, the project, I, I, I'm also very concerned, it's kind of a, a quasi uh, public private project where the private is, it seems to be the driving force, the 3 million and the public is the 1 million. That really scares me and I wonder how much uh, oversight the public has, uh, both your committee and, and other uh, important committees uh, in town. And finally, there's there's been statements made, you know, on, uh, of course, on both sides. But this this constant statement about the 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 eight or ten year life of this material, no one in the world is recycling these fields right now. No one. And uh, in eight or ten years, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would like all munici municipalities to reduce their solid waste disposals, depending on the draft reports you read, anywhere between 50 and 80%. Tom, and can you how, try to wrap up? Thank you. And how hundreds of thousands of un unrecyclable materials can end up in our solid waste stream when we're trying to reduce it, I, th I think is, is uh, just un unsustainable. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I believe. Craig, I'm going to slot your, your last name, but Craig Seal was next. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Um, am I able to share slides? I have a few slides here or no? Um, you can if you can keep it under two minutes. Okay, let me see. Um, everybody see this? Yes, go ahead. Great. So, you know, um, I'm one of the co-presidents of the Dover Sherburn Soccer Club, and I just wanted to speak to some of the benefits that um, we would have from a, from a turf field. So, um, the DS Soccer uh, has about 700 kids in the program, you know, so we're, we're a pretty integral um, part of the fabric of the community. Um, lots of boys and girls ranging from three years old to through uh, eighth grade. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we have uh, for turf, turf, um, one of the reasons why we would like to use it is, is because uh, it's, it's a better surface to learn soccer on. You can see the kids on the left, one of the girls there, the girl there is from Sherburne, frankly, and, um, you know, she, um, uh, she's a great soccer player and learns on turf through her club soccer, but is not able to do so in town soccer. Um, and that's because the fields are grass and, and typically fairly rough and it's, it's hard to learn on those fields. Another reason, sorry, let me move to the next slide. There we go. Another reason that turf would help us is um, because we, we often have rainouts in any season. And so this is just a few pictures of, of Laurel um, uh, after a rain. You can see on the right there, there's actually ducks, that's a field. 
um, that uh, we would normally play on, but we can't uh, in the in the um, case of rainouts. And uh, when we do have rainouts, uh, on, on the left there, you see that many times the games are forfeited. So we're sort of shortchanging our kids there. And on the right, sometimes what we do is we go to various turf fields around, uh, you know, around the state, uh, essentially, and, and rent those fields uh, in order to play our games. And so, um, you know, what that, what the effect that that has is basically, it forces our families to go you know, as far away as Taunton or Marlboro uh, for their home games. And it makes us spend money outside of town and we'd rather spend that money on a turf field in town. And then the last thing that I'll mention is that we have a program um, for children with disabilities that actually has to be held on turf. And we've, we've managed to scrape by with a few hours that, um, that the high school has, has given us, but it's very difficult to get that time on turf. The reason why we need to have it on turf is because there are children um, who are in power chairs. There are, there are children with um, motor uh, uh, difficulties where they need to be playing on turf. This is a program called Top Soccer in which um, children with disabilities are paired. Can you, can you wrap it up, Greg? Yep, they're paired with high school students. And um, really it's sort of a win-win uh, program. And we'd like to continue this program and even expand it. And I'll just leave it at that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And I do see a lot of hands up, I apologize, but Zoom is not keeping them in the order that you raised them. So I, I can't remember what order you came in, so I may call on you out of order, but if your hand is up, I will call on you. Um, so uh, since you're at the top of my screen, George Morrill. Thanks, Steve. Uh, George Morrill, Levin Whitney Drive, and a member of the select board. Um, we've met with REC a lot on this, and I just want to commend them on the work that they put into it. Well, a couple things that I've just heard that I want to um, address. I don't think we, at, at the point that REC is coming at this point, somebody mentioned, why don't we have a full plan, is I don't think it's smart to spend $100,000 on engineering before we get a general feel of whether the town wants this or not. So I think this is a, this is a vote to say, this is something that the kids need. Um, my kids lacrosse season started late this year, again, because the fields weren't ready. Um, my kids also play field hockey and it's a completely different game on grass than it is on turf. So they're not competitive. Uh, one other point I want to bring up is, as Craig said, a lot of times the teams in our town have to rent turf fields in other towns. So when we talk about environmental impact, we have all the parents from Shervern driving all over Massachusetts to play because we don't have our own fields here in town. I think this is something very important to get our kids out and more active earlier in the season in the spring and later in the season in the fall. And it's a great resource for the families of this town. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe Addie May was up early. So Addie May Weiss. Hi, thanks. A uh, couple things. One, the location of Laurel Fields is um, you know, uphill. There are apple orchards. There's definitely, even though they are managed well, there's chemicals. Uh, then you've got the transfer station that was and the land that's a golf course that was a landfill on the other side. And in our wetlands, um, just yesterday, I know Kim Chester and Catherine Rocha with the litter, they hauled out six or seven trash bags of plastic and garbage in our wetlands and it's all throughout town not that this is an excuse but you've got a turf field that's going to be regulated and oversight and can be built in a way where items are contained within that field it's oversight um there's a lot of benefits to these turf fields uh, you know we're, we're so Sherborne parents have been going to fields outside of our town. So our kids are already playing on these fields. It'd be nice to be able to play um, earlier in the season. And also as far as outside entities or private entities, a lot of this private money is coming from years and years and years of dues from Sherborne parents paying for sports in town that have collected and with the goal of this has been studied for a long time, things, technologies have come a long way. So I think there's a lot turf fields today are different than turf, turf fields five years ago. So there's a lot to be, um, have an open mind. And just because it was shot down before, there's reasons why now might be a good time. Thank you. Uh, 
next I'm going to call on Melinda O'Neill, who I did see was in the chat trying to raise her hand earlier. So <laughs> you figured it out. Good job. Good morning. I wanted to be recognized twice. Uh, <laughs> Melinda O'Neill, 8 Fawn Road. Um, I just wanted to share my concerns. Um, I'm concerned about the cost projections and how they might play out over time. Um, turf really requires a different kind of management and I'm concerned about the ability to really accurately make those projections. Um, I am concerned about the control of those loose pellets. It's already been mentioned, the aquifer and the, the wetlands and anyone who's been on a turf field knows those pellets end up everywhere. They're in your house, they're in the kids clothing. And I, I do worry about um, how it runs off, especially when I look at turf fields that my kids have played on over the years, they just keep spilling away. So I, I really encourage um, Rec to keep searching and, and looking at the different kinds of options. And the one thing that I haven't heard mentioned is um, the smell. And I was just hopeful that as we continue this process, because this won't be the end of it today, is that um, somebody somewhere is looking at um, the smell that comes, the, the whatever that is, the, the vapor, the, the gas, the toxins that are released, especially when it's really hot, because I worry about the kids and quite frankly, the adults who are watching, um, breathing that in and what's, what that's doing and how that gets measured. I think that's probably beyond where we will end up in our conversation, but I just thought I'd pitch that out there. I have two lacrosse players um, and I understand the value of having that field and the importance of it and I, the, the points about the driving and all the rest of it. And I think those are important points to be um, considered. But I think at the end of the day, um, I personally would prefer grass and looking at managing it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe, was Michael Guthrie. Hello, thank you. Um, Michael Guthrie, 29 Lake Street, and I'm a former uh, Recreation Commission member, as uh, Chris alluded to, and it's good to see Chris again. It's been a long time. Um, and I'll be very, very brief. Um, one of the things you don't want to get into the history of Laurel Farms, which I could go on for hours about. And my, I've promised my wife years ago, I would never rehash it again. So I'm sticking to that promise. All I wanted to say today is I commend Dave Goldberg and his team and all the work he's done. It is like eye popping. Uh, his presentation I've watched uh, a couple of times and I just wanted to commend him for a tremendous job. The fact that he is basically going to try to raise $3 million probably means he's going to get more than $3 million. Um, and the fact that um, this is going to improve the assets of the town and make Sherburn even a more desirable place to live, uh, I think the return on investment is, is a no-brainer. And I, I say that with all due respect to to um, the abutters, to the Board of Health and what Daryl just uh, outlined, to conservation, I think, I think they're real issues. Um, and I would, I would urge Dave to continue to work with Chris and the abutters uh, on, on the plan and keep them in the loop at all times. I think that helped us back in the day uh, when we were going back and forth with a lot of different solutions. Um, also, there's a turf field at the school, which I think everybody knows about. And with Board of Health concerns and wetlands and the smells and everything that I've heard over the last uh, few minutes, I, that would be a benchmark for me to reach out to the school and see what kind of, what kind of, what, what has happened since they put their field in, the stadium field, which is rubber pellets and all that. I think that could be a good source of information. Thank you for your time. And again, I, I, I I obviously support it, and I think it would be great for the town. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next, uh, I believe Jessa McIntosh. Hi, folks. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jessa McIntosh here. Um, I am the uh, program director for the DSU field hockey program. Um, very excited about uh, the possibility of, of turf over at Laurel. Um, we started this program two years ago in 2019 with only 50 girls. 2020, despite COVID, we had over 100 kids 
and expect at least 25% growth for fall of 2021. Very excited about that. Jessa, we're, we're losing you. I don't know if you have bad, bad cellular reception. Outside, is that any better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, as George mentioned, uh, the, the game of field hockey has evolved incredibly over the last 20 years, given um, the, the um, ubiquity of turf, um, both at youth, middle school, and, and high school and college. Um, so for us, this opportunity is, is incredible because the, um, the competitive, competitiveness of which our game depends on turf um, is, is, you know, goes without saying. Um, right now, having to play over at Laurel um, first through eighth grade, uh, we are at a disadvantage when we're playing uh, just our neighbors, Wellesley, Medway, Milford, Franklin. Um, and so I've encouraged our girls to join club teams, to do clinics on turf, um, so that we can improve and, um, and, and try, to, try to gain more competitiveness. Um, so, you know, my, our feeling both for field hockey and lacrosse, I also represent lacrosse, um, you know, we're, we're very um, supportive of this. I think from a health injury standpoint, um, you know, turf has been, we have not seen um, any data that has really shown that it's um, caused any, any issues in athletes, specifically in our sports. So um, I just wanted to voice my support um, and, and that of our growing program and the parents within our program, which I think if you look at soccer, field hockey and lacrosse is, um, is representative of a huge part of, of our towns in Dover and Sherburne. So thank you everybody for your time and, uh, and work on this effort. Thank you, Jessa. Um, all right, I believe next up was Frank Hoke. Hello, um, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to uh, talk about this. So in our town- um, uh, Sorry, Frank, can you just uh, identify yourself? Sorry, Frank Hook, uh, Six Town Line Road. Regarding the, uh, the, the health of our, our family and our, and our children, sports and uh, our physical activity and the ability of using um, the open fields in, in Sherborne is critically important. And we, we need to allow that to happen um, and continue to happen. We need to do that in the, in the, in the safe uh, way, in the safe manner. So a turf field or a regular field um, it does have this impact on that because with a turf field, turf fields can extend the, 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 the playing time, the playing season. Um, I also teach at Medway, Medway High School. Medway High School has uh, three turf fields. Uh, those turf fields are constantly in use all the time. They're, they're rented by many different places. A lot of kids are playing on, 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 turf, on those turf fields. In 2015, when we had the uh, really terrible winter season, uh, Medway was one of the few towns at the time that had turf fields in this area. And the people were, you know, on a waiting list to use those, those fields. So turf fields def definitely have this benefit for our health and um, wellness of our community and for our kids. I do understand and uh, uh, hear the, the, the concerns about um, the materials and their drinking water and the environment. And I think that's a critically important aspect. And I don't think that should be minimized, but it should be balanced with, with the aspect of kids being able to um, play their sports more for a longer period of time. Uh, I haven't heard any discussion about organic uh, pellets. I don't know if there has been any thought about that by our uh, athletic, athletic department. Um, and if there's enough research on our organic turf, but um, I'd like to hear some more about that and think that we should have uh, more discussion on that. But in, in terms of in general turf over natural, it definitely extends to the playing field. And then there's always those issues with, with those rains in the water and using use of the fields that sometimes fields need to be rested so that uh, grass can grow back and all that. So there are definitely uh, benefits of 
serve in certain areas and also thank you frank can you wrap up in the others thank you thank you uh all right i believe next we had uh jeff waldron and then daryl beardsley thanks steve yeah i just very quickly wanted to say uh i'm i'm not in favor of taking any action on this at this time i uh, as chris brown pointed out i think we need to do uh, detailed design and more steady, including the environmental impact assessment. All these other towns you mentioned have public water supplies. They're not drinking the water from their ground that's not treated. So, um, and it's also a public water supply is continuously tested, whereas pe most people in town don't test their well water quality at all. So, um, and I also wanted to point out that wasn't mentioned on the presentation that the uh, Proponents estimated that the use of the field would be 80% by teams from outside of town and 20% by teams from inside town in terms of the reimbursement model. So I'm not willing to compromise our drinking water uh, for 80% use of people from outside of town. So I would advocate that we um, hold on the vote no action and uh, further study this issue. And I was very active in sports in town and coached soccer for 16 years. And I founded the boys youth lacrosse program and I founded the girls youth lacrosse program. So I'm not adverse to sports at all, uh, but I, I don't think this is ready for prime time. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, all right, Daryl and then Dave Goldberg. All right, I wanted to address a question raised by Melinda O'Neill about studies of uh, what gets into the air. And that is part of what the EPA study was about was exposure of players. And I'll also note that is a limitation of the EPA study is that they were only looking at it from the perspective of players, not nothing to do with groundwater impacts as of yet. Uh, the, I believe, but I'm not positive, but I have to dig through my notes. I'm pretty sure it was a Massachusetts DEP study, if not another major government entity that looked at uh, what gets released in the air because there are volatiles and semi-volatiles present. And while they determined that it's not a significant increase um, at the field uh, and significant is laden with a lot of materials in the environmental risk assessment realm. Uh, and that levels would be equivalent to say an urban environment. But indoor fields, absolutely there's concern about health impacts. So, so we are benefiting from this being outdoors, but it does mean that there, there is some exposure for kids to something just expected to be low levels. Um, and what was the other? I think I'll stop there and address other questions as they come up. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, just a just a couple of points. Um, you know, Steve, you you talked earlier about trying to raise the denominator in the town and how we keep our taxes lower. This is this is an opportunity uh, to raise the denominator, right? We know that there's interests, and uh, you know they've been characterized as out of town teams. My my son plays on a club team. He plays in Medfield. They go lease. Um, fields from Medfield. This is an opportunity to, um, to have those teams play in town. Um, we know how many hours our in-town teams need. Uh, we have the advantage of having a huge facility over at Laurel with, uh, with a significant amount of space. We're not taking away any hours from in-town teams at all. We're just leveraging the fact that we have space and can, um, and can essentially generate revenue from these fields. I will say we do know a town that has well water in our community that has one of these fields. Uh, it's right next door where our high school is. I think Frank mentioned it earlier. So it's not that, um, you know, this is unheard of in a well water town. Um, and I know it's been discussed in terms of keeping like the natural grass and continuing to manage that. There's significant environmental impacts to that. If you're, man if you're trying to manage it at the level to, to, um, to keep it consistent, uh, and even if you did all of that perfectly, it still will not extend the playing season. Uh, the natural grass only has about a quarter of the, uh, of the hours of use that the, that the synthetic fields have. So even, even with that option of maintaining the natural, natural grass, we still only get a, a fraction of the number of hours uh, in terms of playing time. We have looked at organic um, infill, organic infill 
um, you know, it's not a panacea. There's there's pros and cons. Um, we're still trying to weigh the the um, the potential uh, you know uh, uh, trade offs from from one versus the other. But I would say organic is 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 certainly something we've looked at. But but like I said, it's it's not necessarily a slam dunk in terms of um, in terms of a choice. And then the last thing I'll say is um, from a financial perspective. This is this is a, a sort of a different model. It's more like Woodhaven. We're generating revenue every single day, every single year for um, from these fields. And we, you know, again, if uh, going back to the analysis of the number of hours and the um, and and the uh, revenue that comes in from the fields and the discussions we've had with surrounding towns, we will easily be able to pay off the debt service that the that the that the town will incur as a result of the fields. That's it. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, Gavin. I just wanted to quickly touch on a couple of questions also. So there was a question or two about recycling. Just to be a little more specific, there, there absolutely are methods for reusability and recycling that are already underway in this country. So if there's a feeling that that is not a possibility, that just wouldn't be correct. We've already spoken with multiple places that are doing things like this. Uh, so there are reusability and recycling options uh, and will be even more so in, in 10 years when a turf has to be replaced. Uh, the PFAs are a very valid question. I have three kids of my own young kids and you know these are questions I ask myself in regards to the turf. So we're doing tons of research on that. We already have uh, information from a Martha's Vineyard study that the PFAs and the turf are almost completely undetectable. And they actually found that the PFAs in the soil itself was more than the PFAs in the turf. So you can make the argument that it's making less PFAs because of the turf being there. Now, there may be other studies that are showing something different. So I won't pretend to say that there is nothing showing other stuff, but there are certainly studies showing the safety of, of turf fields in regards to PFAs. Uh, and Dave did talk about the financial aspect of this. And like he said, this is something that is the Woodhaven uh, example where it is creating revenue for itself to maintain itself. Thank you. Thank you. You stopped talking just as I put some food in my mouth. <laughs> um, all right, uh, John Hartnett. Uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Um, as the current president of Dover Sherburn Youth Lacrosse, I just want to make it uh, on record just that it's uh, this is a fantastic uh, project that we would support. Turf would be a, a huge opportunity for us. Uh, lacrosse is just a one a better sport on turf and, and where the game is really going. Uh, but it would really allow us to uh, build a more competitive program um, and just have a, a more robust program for. Uh, all the different tournaments and everything else that we want to participate in that we currently cannot. So uh, fully in support of this from the lacrosse program. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Daryl Beardsley. I wanted to touch upon the PFAS and the study that was mentioned for Martha's Vineyard. Excuse me, I just have to bring up some notes. So here's where PFAS is a very complex issue. There are thousands of versions of PFAS. So when we say PFAS, it's an entire class of chemical, thousands. There is a standard test that only looks for six of those PFAS because they're prevalent their toxic effects have already been evaluated. That tends to be what gets measured. And it's, it's enormously expensive and we don't even have test method yet, yet to detect all of the others or approved test methods. So um, the tests that were done in Martha's Vineyard, for example, looked at that standard six, but they also did a test on other PFAS. And so here's what happens. We're talking about, um, it's the F is fluorine is present. And then, so you have poly, uh, even I'm forgetting what it stands for, polysulfonic fluorinated, and then A and then S at the end or A at the end. So you've got PF and then S or A at the end, 
Um, and then any number of combinations of numbers and letters in between that, that account for all those variations. So here's what happens in the industry. A problem is identified with a particular PFAS. The industry switches to one that's not known yet to have any problems. Um, and so one of the tests that they did, they found it at 0.83 something um, nanograms per gram, but that translates into 837 or something uh, parts per trillion. We're looking at drinking water standards. Again, it would be diluted presumably in drinking water, but drinking water standards of 20 parts per trillion. And frankly, uh, some groups consumer reports is arguing for one part per trillion. And even the Bottled Water Association is looking at five parts per trillion as thresholds for exposure to some of these chemicals. And we keep learning new things. So on thank you to the Conservation Commission agent who identified an article that just came out or a news release from EPA for, as I mentioned, uh, the the terminology of how these things are named. So PFBS was uh, just, they just completed a toxicological study of that and they've come out with a standard for that. So now that's a new one that's going to be regulated that was previously not looked for and, and evaluated. So this is a big deal. We're on the cusp of this issue and trying to get our hands on it. And this would mean increasing the risk, whether it's present already or not, we are going to be increasing the risk as a result of this. And that's part of our concern is that there are too many unknowns around this. Thank you, Dara. Uh, Marin? Uh, there we go, I'm muted. Uh, I have uh, listened carefully to this and I'm really impressed by the amount of information that's been gathered on both sides of this. And it's a complex issue. Uh, you know, my, my approach is look for all the information you can possibly get. And I think we're doing that here. But there's a couple of like close to home questions that I have that are not highly technical. One is there is a turf field at the high school and uh, I'm, I'm told and I observed that it's only used for games, for football games and uh, a few other things, but most of the time it's not being used at all. So I'm just wondering, why is that? I'm curious. And the second uh, question I would have is, um, have, has the Rec Commission uh, consulted any towns that decided against turf fields to understand why they did so? For example, Lincoln uh, uh, considered turf fields uh, several years ago and decided against it. It would be interesting to know what that discussion was and why that decision was made. Thank you. Uh, Gavin, are you able to answer the questions that Marion posed? The, the first question I can in regards to the high school field. So I'm actually the assistant baseball coach over at Dover Sherborne High School. Uh, that field is used all the time. It's hard to even get time on that field. It's not used just for games. I can tell you that even the baseball team has used that field occasionally for practices when the regular baseball field, which is natural grass, can't be used because of weather or field issues. So um, the high school field is definitely used all the time on a regular basis. I, I'm under the impression that Lincoln Sudbury High School has has turf fields as well, but I, I don't want to say that for a fact, but I, I believe that's the case. Yes, I, I was referring Thank to you. the town of Lincoln, excuse me. And so I would say that they have chosen at Lincoln to have turf fields at the high school. So I, I don't know if we could count them as a place that has chosen not to necessarily have turf fields, but I wanted to mention the high school turf field usage as well. Thank you. Thanks, George. You know, just to add to what Gavin said, um, <clears throat> I think the point of these fields is that it'll be the, allow the youth sports to start using turf. The high school field is really reserved for the high school teams. So the kids really aren't allowed to use it or have the time to use it until they get to high school. So they're training on a different surface than they're gonna be on. And the town, the, the high school just doesn't have the time 
there's not time available on the field for any youth sports when the high school teams are practicing and playing there. Thank you. <clears throat> I somehow don't believe that we have actually exhausted um, public commentary, but uh, um, another, oh, Daryl just popped up. Go ahead, Daryl. All right, this time, uh, Daryl Beardsley, 54 Forest Street. I'm commenting as a resident and based on my professional experience, what I've done for the last number of decades is work with industry and governments on looking at how to reduce risks, environmental risks, environmental liability, uh, what kind of reporting has to be done under Sarbanes-Oxley regarding uh, future liabilities of companies and whether they can attract stockholders. Um, and a key point of that is looking for what is technically and financially feasible to do differently that would reduce those environmental risks. And these are multinational corporations around the world who will embrace that. And so I'm going to advise the town as I would any of these clients. And that is, there are uh, lots of examples and really good ones are in Marblehead, Massachusetts. They have been since 1998, managing turf fields in the towns organically. And that's been very successful and they have a robust program and, and use of the fields and the same in Springfield, Massachusetts has also been doing this. And Springfield has a mix of both organically managed natural turf fields and they have artificial turf fields. And they have cost information on what it takes to do that. And frankly, if we put the effort, I believe, into improving the uh, substrate, say, of a natural grass turf field, that we could accomplish a lot of the things that are being discussed here. If anyone's, my daughter had the pleasure of playing on Wellesley fields while she was in high school. They have a beautiful soccer field there that is natural grass. Three day tournament, her team kept winning. They played throughout the entire weekend in the rain and it was beautiful and it functioned really well. So it is possible and I would like to see that we examine what the alternatives are, maybe a little bit better. And another issue with the uh, grass yeah. is if we Darryl, need- can you can you try to wrap up? Okay, I was going to say another alternative would be a surface that's specifically geared for people in wheelchairs or ha who have other issues, eliminate the, the grass because that's where the problem is right now. Don't have a crumb rubber increased surface area for leaching, have something that's flat, be innovative and take a whole different approach to it. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, I think uh, Lanny Rubens hasn't figured out how to raise his hand electronically. So he's been trying oh. to speak, I think. Okay, uh, go ahead, Lanny. Um, again, to repeat, but these are from a couple of articles. One from the Washington Post. This is written by a professor and director of the Division of Environmental Health in the School of Public Health at, God forbid, Georgia State University. In the meantime, though, there is little question in the mind of many scientists that crumb rubber should not be a first choice material for children to play on. Parents should be able to just enjoy watching their children playing sports and not worry that they are being put unnecessarily at risk. And then from the Washington Post, and this is from Betsy Sutherland, the former director of science and technology in the EPA Office of Water during the Obama administration. That is a big concern since this turf is in many communities and is designed to drain precipitation off the fields, which can carry soluble contaminants into groundwater underlying the turf. Groundwater in turn can be the direct source of drinking water for private wells and community water systems. Again, as many have said, it's just a matter of risk. It's a risk assessment and it just happens to be a risk and whether people want to take it, well, that's, I guess that's fine or, you know, or not take the risk, but we are voting 
on doing something that has a risk. Thank you. Um, calling for uh, any additional public comments. And there will be a second round of public comments later. So um, all right, last call for this round of public comments. All right, seeing none, uh, I'm closing public comments and opening advisory uh, comments. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll be begin sort of as chair. Uh, what one of the things um, that I have been struggling with is uh, somewhat uh, separating my sort of personal feelings um, and values uh, from my role as an advisory member. Uh, you know, I am, uh, I consider myself to be uh, an environmentalist um, at heart. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, my wife is on the Conservation Commission. Um, and yet I somehow find <clears throat> myself the chair of a predominantly financial oversight committee, uh, which is very odd. Um, and so trying to, to look at the different angles of this, right? Because uh, people bring up very good points um, on all different sides of this. And I am, um, I believe uh, I, I can appreciate the perspectives um, that, that everybody is raising. Um, and I don't discount anything that, that people have been saying on either side of the issue. Um, I would ask that everybody on the advisory committee uh, try to, as, as I am trying to, to separate um, how you feel perhaps, you know, as a, as a parent or as, you know, a, um, a resident with particular, you know, I don't know, personal values um, to, to, to try to, to think more from the perspective of advisory and maybe so, no okay, let's all sit down and talk about how we're gonna and, uh afford to uh, go on can somebody mute alicia this. please <laughs> thank you um to try to think about um uh, how this will affect the town and what the um you know what the effect on the town can be and make our recommendation based on um uh on that analysis you know we try to be factual and evidence-based. Um, um, so like before, um, before going on uh, with, with how I think I'm going to vote on this, I would like to first open the floor to the rest of the advisory and um, see how you feel. Steve, I'll begin. Just looking at it from a financial perspective, uh, David and his team significantly lowered the risk to taxpayers from the financing by servicing the debt, possibly in the short term, if there's a requirement for the debt. I've encouraged the team multiple times to fully finance this so that elements resolved. Um, and they probably can get three quarters of the way there or more. So that's that. From an investment to the town, the return on that investment is multidimensional in terms of youth benefits, which have been uh, mentioned uh, numerous times, plus the impact to property values. As high schools, uh, especially Division Three, it's a requirement to have a turf field to compete in Division Three sports, and Sherburne and Dover have been a uh, perennial championship contender in, in multiple sports that play on turf fields, lacrosse and field hockey were mentioned here. And so the ability and availability of a turf field for youth sports, again, will accrue to every taxpayers as new families seek the Sherburne experience of raising families uh, now and into the future. So from a financial perspective, I, I believe this is a low risk, high benefit return on investment to every taxpayer. All right. Anyone else from advisory? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that from a strictly financial perspective. Um, 
you know, the, the, the interest from club sports is clear. Um, I've, I've been to several presentations with the recreation committee and um, they're going to have no problem uh, generating the revenue that they expect from these fields. Um, from a quality of play, you know, it's, it's clearly superior. There's no doubt about that. There's no question about that. For me, the only question is the environmental impact. Um, I share everyone's concerns, all the concerns that were raised so far, um, but also th there are different materials and, and I, some of the recreation, you know, they, they only had five minutes to present all their uh, information, but there are different materials that you can use for the fill uh, of these fields. There are more uh, expensive ones that may be safer. And, you know, I would encourage uh, the recreation committee to continue studying that um, and, you know, if it's a choice between a more expensive field and a safer field, obviously, I would go with the, the more expensive and safer field. Um, and, you know, hopefully, just from the, the revenues that we're able to generate from the club sports, um, that, that should be able to cover it. Um, but, but in general, you know, to, to put a stake in the sand, I, you know, I, I am in favor of the project. A question as well as a comment. Um, my, my question is, uh, I think we heard earlier that some other fields, I think Wellesley was mentioned, you know, are natural fields, but but operate very effectively um, in, in terms of some of the issues that we're currently having at Laurel Fields. And, and my question is whether, you know, $4 million plus all the money that it will take to, you know, maintain and replace these fields, that's a lot of money. And so my question is, you know, could that money be used in a way that could render natural fields um, nearly, if not as usable, you know, nearly as usable as what the turf would offer? And has that analysis been done? And, um, you know, if so, what does it show? Dave or Gavin, can you answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, the reality is that when you start looking at fields that play on the ground, there's really no comparison to turf. I mean, that's what the kids are playing on outside of outside of uh, you know Laurel when they go and travel. So when you start talking about field hockey or soccer, um, the the idea of even maintaining a natural grass field is a completely different experience in terms of the play. Um, similarly, like Wellesley has, I mean, they have artificial as well as as grass, right? So it's not it's not one versus the other. And we've been trying to say that from the very beginning, we think it's, it's our responsibility to maintain both at, at, at as high a quality as possible. Um, the reality is also that uh, you, when you look at the interest from club teams, they are looking for uh, not uh, for synthetic fields as well. So when we look at the money that's being that the private money that would be raised, the money that would come in through the revenue, um, all of that is through in, is from interest in the synthetic fields. So, you know, again, I'll go back to the budget com conversation earlier, which is if we want to raise taxes and we want to significantly put money into maintaining the grass fields, um, you know, how, how much of an appetite is, is the town going to have for that when you have to potentially put off other difficult decisions in favor of that? Um, whether that be other infrastructure in town. So the fact that there's interest for private money, um, as well as the club teams uh, for artificial and, and the fact that it extends the season and is a better playing experience, in our mind, it's a no brainer because we just can't replicate that with grass. And then, and then just a comment, I, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for all the work that the rec department has done and the work that others have done on this. And, you know, as a parent, I totally understand, you know, wanting to fully support the, you know, the, the interests and hopes and dreams of kids. I, my kids played on Laurel Fields. I have very happy memories of Laurel Fields. I have a nephew who used to be a professional soccer player. So, I mean, I certainly have nothing against soccer, but um, it feels to me from the discussion today that maybe this is premature. Um, you know, we've, we've heard from the abutters that they were not uh, aware of this and, and that they would like more time to consider. We've heard from some of the town committees that they really didn't have a lot of notice and um, would like more time to, to weigh in on this. It's, I'm not 
entirely clear even which committees would need to approve this um, before it would move forward. I, I'm not even sure we've, we've gotten through that analysis. Um, we have a lot of environmental information, you know, Brendan, as you just point out, pointed out, there may be some materials that would be safer than others. Have we fully vetted that? Do we know what the safest possible way to do this would be if we're going to go forward with it? It's just so many questions have been raised today that um, it feels to me like this might be premature. If fundraising has to happen anyway, you know, $3 million is a lot of money to fundraise. Um, that will take time. Um, going through whatever town approvals will be necessary will take time. So I'm just wondering if, you know, maybe we have enough time anyway to, um, to, to, to not uh, make a final decision on this right now, maybe postpone it. Um, you know, my understanding is that there may even be um, a, a special town meeting later this year, in which case potentially this could be considered again at that point. But even worst case scenario, if it were a full year before it came up again, that would be a lot of time for for us to really get our ducks in order and, and go through all the, you know, the, the parties who have an interest in this. So I, I guess my my preference would be that we, um, you know, that we postpone this decision, this final decision. Um, I have actually a couple of questions that, that do kind of spin off of that. Um, I understand that, you know, there's a whole range of, um, uh, options for the fill material and your I know that the the two top choices that you guys had presented I think to us and or the uh, Board of Health was crumb rubber and coated crumb rubber um, but there were also several um, organic options including I believe your third option was a type of recycled wood um, one of the drawbacks of that was that it was only introduced in 2020 so there's not as much sort of um, history and research and experience with it um, but I did I wanted to um, ask you guys uh, sort of uh, what do we know about that, the recycled wood um, filler and, um, you know, what is the, the cost of that? And then sort of a broader question becomes, um, I think a lot of people are concerned about what the choice of the pellet is. And so if this were to pass, does the decision, does that decision lie entirely within the purview of the rec commission or uh, would there be additional sort of town input on the final choice of the material? So we have looked, I mean, yeah, yes, we have looked at um, organic infill. It brings its own potential issues as well though. Um, organic infill is light and it tends to move uh, so when you have rain, it tends to sort of follow the rain and, and you end up with these, these sort of lines in the field um, after a heavy rain. And you can imagine if that happens right before a game, the kids come out, that, pre that in and of itself presents a, a safety hazard for the kids. And so there's, always, there, there's a trade-off. It's, it's not a one is, is inherently better than the other. We, you know... Um, we have to consider them. We have to consider them both. Uh, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, with regard to whether or not we just get the choice, um, no, we have our preference. But, but again, we have to make sure that we're going back to Brandon's comment that we're responsible from a from an environmental impact. So we would need to understand what the, you know, both the groundwater and the and the materials that we choose, what the impact is. Um, you know, I feel a little bit like it's a catch 22. If you come to the town early, uh, you know, there's a lot of, Hey, you don't have your, you know, we haven't done everything, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of flushing it out. And if we come too late, it's like, Hey, you know, we didn't get a chance to, you know, to, to have input into this process. Um, so we're coming early. We don't have everything flushed out. We do not have final plans yet. Um, that will cost about a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. No one's going to want to move forward. We have to go raise those funds privately. No one's going to want to put that money forward, uh, under with knowing that the town is not behind it. So we have a, we have the first phase of this project is to go and, and finish the engineering plans, so we can present that back to the town and we can get input, and then we can do things like understand the environmental impact and we can do the studies and so forth, but. This is a, we're all involved in this early. Um, we've got to go figure out exactly what the plans are. 
and then um, you know, and hopefully we get the town behind it so that we can begin the we can begin the first phase. Steve, additionally, as as a dad who's on the rec committee, I have a, a fourth grade daughter and a fifth grade son who would both be using this new field for for at least a few years. I can tell you that safety is of utmost important to me as a dad of those children who would be using this field. So I, I would have no plans to be making choices for the town that, and for my children themselves that would you know, be affecting their safety. I would be wanting to be as safe as possible with these decisions as well. And as a question, the, so the, the various sort of organic um, options for the film material, are they categorically more expensive than crumb rubber and coated crumb rubber? They and are, that's I mean, that's of... not, that's a secondary factor for us. Um, if okay. we have to go raise more money, we will. Um, but, yeah. but again, those would have to be tested as well. It just so happens that the, the study we've been referencing on Martha's Vineyard also used um, that organic, um, uh, I think it's wood, it, it might be pine wood. So that was actually tested as part of that study. So, so yeah. Um, okay. Those, those, and then they are more expensive, but, but again, that's a second yeah. factor. But, but it's not, it's not prohibitive. No, no. Um, another question I have about the um, financing is that, of course, you say your goal is to raise three million or more and then a million from the town. So then the one of my questions then becomes, because several times I think you've mentioned that oh, ultimately it might be nothing from the town because we might get more than three million. Uh, I mean, if I were in your position, if I knew that I had the town's approval for a million dollars, I mean, once I hit 3 million in my fundraising, that would be go time, right? So do you have, <clears throat> is there a, a, a time window where you're like, we're fundraising for this amount. And when we get to eight months from now, if we're at three and a half million, that's when go time is, or when, when does the, the project trigger for you? Um, I would say that we want to borrow as little money as possible. Like that's our goal. It's not in our best interest to, to have any debt service at all um because that debt service is money that we could be putting towards other projects again i mentioned the, the the fences over at the tennis court drive me crazy um and so i would i would love to raise it all um even if we started to you have to remember like we'll we'll raise three uh, in which case it will trigger the the article and and we'll be we'll have the um, ability to borrow the one we don't stop raising even at that point, we can we feel like we can start the project because we've got the we've got the full amount funded, but we won't stop fundraising because I don't want to borrow that extra million. If we if we can avoid it, we will. And don't forget, we'll, we're going to start when we start spending the money. It's going to be the private money first. So we, as we draw that down, we don't stop fundraising um, because like we hope to never have to get to the money borrow the, the money that the town is uh, is allowing us to borrow. Thank you. <clears throat> um, a few more sort of questions or concerns I may have uh, there, there. I've heard from other advisory members also, and I'm trying to, to collate them. Um, in terms of the, the risk to the town, um, part of this may just be the wording of the um, article, um, but it notes that um, the town will borrow a um, million dollars. It also notes uh, in in, in the article that you'll be uh, creating the stabilization fund for the you know purpose of the decommissioning, um, uh, but it doesn't actually state um, specifically that revenue um, from the fields would first go towards the debt service. So if you're in a scenario where there wasn't actually quite enough revenue to both service the debt and fund this stabilization fund, I'm don't, just wondering, legally, you may be required to first put money into that fund. And then if there's not enough left for the debt service, that essentially at that point, the town would be liable for the debt service. Um, is that, is that, has that concern been raised? I don't even know if it's valid or not. So I'm welcome any other. Yeah. So um, we would talk to the to town council about, um, there, it doesn't specify exactly how the stabilization fund will get, um, will get funded. I think the first couple of years of the field, we will probably take it into the revolving fund um, and then pay off the debt service. And then once we once we understand the revenue stream, we will we will fund that um, 
that stabilization fund directly from from the field revenue. I know the town of Natick they put aside if you were to if you were to lease the field for let's say $175 an hour, there's a 75 of it actually says field replacement uh, cost and it goes directly into a fund. Um, so that's our that's our intention. Um, and by that point, yeah, we should um, we should have a better understanding of what percentage of the field revenue has to go into the stabilization fund. But either way, um, the the debt service it would be for if we borrowed the money from the town, the debt service would be first. Um, even if we had a shortfall on the stabilization side, that would be okay. We'd have plenty of time to to catch up. But our but our you know certainly our our uh, our obligation to the debt service is first. Thank you. Um, and then sort of some, some general comments and concerns and some of these answers I know are basically unanswerable. They're just kind of me um, thinking aloud, um, but certainly you, you guys have done a, a, lot, of, a lot of work, um, a lot of detailed work into this proposal. And I do believe I agree with Brendan and Peter that I think the, the financial, um, um analysis that you've done is is um sound it's conservative i do believe that um there's enough buffer that most likely uh what you what you plan on will come to pass in terms of the revenue um one of one of my concerns and again this is the sort of uh, uh unknowable is because uh uh pfas are things that are sort of just emerging as a public health threat and we don't know that much about it yet, right? And I, I think that anybody who can say for sure that this, that they are safe and not to be concerned about is either misinformed or disingenuous. Um, and I think that anybody who says that for sure this is going to kill all of our children is also misinformed or disingenuous. Um, but it is a concern because there is a lack of information, right? And if, when you look at you know, I, I try, to, try to, to fall back on what our, you know, town elected and appointed boards that are here for protecting the public health and the environment, what I, I have to put a lot of, um, I have to put a, a lot of capital in what they say, right? And um, it was not a ringing endorsement from the Board of Health, and it was a pretty clear no from the Conservation Commission, right? And a lot of that has to do with concerns about not actually knowing that much yet about what's going on with um, the PFAS. So I worry, you know, it's like kind of as an analogy, what if we find out that PFAS is the new uh, asbestos, right? I mean, best, asbestos was wonderful, right? I mean, you could even take a utilitarian view. I think people have made this argument that asbestos um, saved more lives by preventing house fires than 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 lost through um, uh, mesothelioma, right? But 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 still, what what if PFAS turns out to be the new asbestos, right? And then X number of years down the line, the field becomes unusable, killing your revenue stream. And then furthermore, that the remediation becomes um, a, an order of magnitude greater than the sort of million dollars or whatever it is that you're planning. So it is kind of a disaster scenario. And I believe that, you know, in that, in that case, the town is totally on the hook for that entire um, situation. And that, you know, it's an unanswerable question and it's probably alarmist, but it is, I think that the risk of that is, is non-zero. Um, and so I, I worry about that risk for the town, right? That's what we're entering into. Um, I do, in terms of the benefit to the town, it is, ultimately uh, probably a minority um, um, percentage of the town that directly benefits from the fields, right? It is, sure, it is our children, but not every resident in town has children who are going to be playing on these fields, right? Um, so I, I, do not, I do not question um, the value from an athletic perspective um, and a recreation perspective. Uh, I, I think that all of those arguments are valid and sound. Um, but it is not that 80% of the, the town is going to get a direct benefit from the fields. Um, I, I like the fact that it is revenue generating. Um, I do push back a little bit on, you know, you were linking this to my introductory comments about um, expanding the denominator. This doesn't really go into the denominator, right? Because this money stays within the recreation revolving fund, which occurs outside of uh, the tax rate. So the money that you generate um, does not go ultimately towards lowering the tax rate um, because, because the revenue 
remains within the revolving fund other than what comes out to service the debt, which is kind of a net zero for the town. Um, you know, if ultimately there was excess revenues that was going into the general fund, thereby lowering the tax rate, then I think that that would be certainly be an argument in that in that direction. But I, I think that ultimately one of the selling points of this project is that it is revenue neutral for the town. It is not it is not for the town in terms of the average taxpayer. Um, it does not lower anybody's tax rate. Um, um, so th so these are all the things that I am I am considering, um, and I. I don't think you need to respond to any of those specific things because I, I think a lot of those questions are unanswerable, but that's just to, kind of to put out where I am on, on, on this right now. Um, and I would certainly welcome um, additional um, advisory input. I do, Daryl, I do see your hand is up, but I'll just ask you to wait until the second round of uh, public comments um, for, for what you have to say. But I would, I would very much like to hear from each advisory member in terms of what you're thinking right now. I guess I'll go next, if I may, Steve. Um, Steve Leahy here. I am in favor of this project. I think that this um, project does benefit numerous residents of the town. I think this project makes the town more attractive to um, potential residents of the town. Um, I think that the team who has been working on this, the Recreation Committee, has put in a heck of a lot of work. I think that the financials, as you mentioned, is specifically one of the considerations for the advisory committee are <clears throat> are non-negative, as you point out, not necessarily positive, but non-negative. And so therefore, by improving the town in general, our infrastructure, our appeal to um, residents with no cost, I think that's a benefit to everybody. Uh, I do understand the potential health threats um, of these unknown aspects of some of the materials that may be used. That's a lot of ifs and mays and, and, and potentials. I think that um, as was noted by Board of Health and I think it was actually Conservation Committee, this area is adjacent to wetlands, I believe was the term that was used. And so therefore I assume that our Conservation Committee is already paying attention and monitoring. And so while we're on the lookout for any negative uh, results to the town's water supply. It's not like we need to necessarily change what we're doing or add any cost there. They, again, I, I would expect and believe that they are already monitoring that water supply. I guess the final thing that I would say on this is that uh, every once in a while, a town needs to make a change and improve itself. And I believe this would be an improvement to our town at no net financial cost. And I understand that there may be some potential risks in taking these actions and the risks, if they are valid, are dire. But I believe there's also risk in inaction. And so I'm in favor. I'll follow that. That was tough. That was uh, Stephen. I thought that was really well said. Um, I have a little bit of a different perspective. I think the, the upside of the project has been made very clear. Um, uh, and Dave and the other members of the committee, I commend you guys on, on doing the work to establish that upside. I, I, um, for me, it's, it's just a question of how do we get comfort around the, the, um, the environmental risks and particularly the risk of contamination uh, of groundwater. Like, you know, my view, we have a, a, an obligation to, to, um, um, to be very thoughtful about the risks that we're exposing abutters to um, uh, in a project like this. And we've heard from a couple of abutters, we've heard from conservation, we've heard from um, uh, health. Um, you know, I think those, those considerations for me outweigh the upside of, uh, of the project in terms of playing experience in terms of the economics. So, you know, what I'd love to come away from today, uh, from this meeting with today is some way to give recreation, number one, the readout that like, okay, it's worth, in, it's worth investing in, in um, uh, planning the project and doing, you know, studying it a little bit more so that we can balance the environmental piece against the playability piece. Um, I mean, what I've heard today, I think there's plenty of people who are in favor of it. Um, 
it, it would be nice to be able to get something tangible out of this or maybe to make the vote on the warrant article at town meeting a readout on that you know maybe the way you do that is what's like if it's going to cost a hundred thousand bucks to do the environmental impact study and the planning you know i'm i, I would be willing to have the town kick in like 25k or something that gives you the ability to essentially have the town weigh in on whether we're going to spend money on planning this thing that gives you your up or down readout um as to the level of interest in the town um but you know i think it, it, that's that's it. i i'm no no action at this point so thank you if, if i can hear from let's see wasim natalie and mark i don't think that you guys have weighed in yet so i'm interested to hear what you think yeah, but this is Mark briefly. Um, my sentiments pretty much mirror Steve Leahy's. So I'm not going to go through each point by point again, but I'm in favor. Thank you. Wasim and Natalie, thoughts? I, I think that I kind of agree with Drew that we could, if we could do something smaller, you know, like smaller to get kind of if the town's really in, would be really interested in this anyway first i could i agree pretty much with what drew said i guess i see i i see the points of wanting a better playing field and i think that that's an important thing to do and didn't you say steve that there could be a special town meeting later anyway Yes, I believe that there's talk of, of the, the likelihood of uh, a fall town meeting this year. And so, the, and this, I, yeah, and is it possible that they could raise all the money themselves and then we're out of it, right? It, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the one of the challenges is that it's. Uh, I, I think they're looking for this in order to kickstart their fundraising, um, but. Uh, but yes, I, I believe that that's an option, and, and it, it may force them to to alter their strategy. You know, I mean, I think that uh, correct anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, one of the strategies they could employ would be that well, they need a two thirds majority for this motion to pass a town meeting because it involves uh, the town borrowing money. If they raised all of the money. Uh, and only needed permission from the town to use the town land in this way, I believe it would be a simple majority. Um, so so this the town meeting vote could also be some sort of a, a kind of a, a heat check vote, right? Uh, because if if 54% vote for, then they'll know that if they can just raise all the money, then that's, you know, you know, they can they can do it. Um, but 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 again, that's kind of future strategizing i think i think right now we want to just focus on the current article do we do we support it or not is it um the current article like there's a requirement for the end of life funding yes but there's not a requirement for the yearly debt service is that true i believe it's not written into the article but um yeah. i think that that is the plan of their um of their financial model and Again, they are not a private independent, you know, entity where they can just go rogue. They are a town department and they are under the purview of, you know, the select board. And so I, I don't think they can take the money and run, you know, and I don't, I mean, they're, they're upstanding men. I don't think they're going to be doing that. <laughs> okay. I guess at this point, I would um, vote no action. I'm with, I guess I'm with Drew with that. Thanks. And Wasim, do you have a thoughts? Uh, very good arguments on both sides. It's it's. Uh, I am in support of uh, kind of improving the playing experience of the kids. Um, I just want to respond to like a comment that the benefit of this project is just for a, you know, a certain percentage of the town residents. But I, I don't. I don't think that that should be the primary consideration. I mean, if there was a project that benefits, you know, another age group within town, I don't think that we should vote no for that project. So, um, uh, and also I want to respond to a comment about uh, this not making the denominator uh, bigger. I think the, uh, 
I, I, I'm, I'm interpreting the comment uh, that this would make the denominator bigger as, as saying that this would be a more attractive. Uh, so more attractive to new residents choosing this town would mean you know higher property values and, and so make the denominator bigger that way. Um, the environmental impact is, is real. Uh, that's, that's really my main hesitation to this uh, for the abutters as well. I mean, those are concerns and uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of, if we say go do environmental impact and come back, my feeling is, <laughs> you know, um, that project's going to go away for another 20 years just because it is almost... Um, you know, I mean, these studies take, you know, forever to, to do an environmental impact study. I mean, I, I don't know, do we, do we determine that um, the environmental impact of, you know, let's say using pressure treated wood in our houses? I, I, I don't know. Um, so I'm, I'm very conflicted. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I have not formulated a good opinion. Um, I do like the idea of Drew, like uh, also the question that came up, like if this was to pass, Will the decision of what material to be used and so on be solely in the hands of the uh, rec commission? And I do like Drew's idea of the uh, kind of a readout. If this is a matter of just proceeding with this project, you know, let's 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 do that. Um, so again, I, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know. I don't have a good formulated opinion. I am in favor of the project in terms of the improving the experience for our youth. Um, and uh, at the same time, I do want to be conscious of the character of our town in terms of, you know, we want to protect um, natural resources, uh, the, the, the safety, especially of butters. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's going to be almost a toss up in my case. Um, I, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, one, another thing that I did want to point out is that I, I believe based on the conservation commission's, uh, meeting last night, um, this project, um, uh, does, uh, fall within a, uh, wetland buffer zone and it was, does fall under the jurisdiction of conservation. So, um, it would have to go <clears throat> in front of, uh, conservation, um, with a notice of intent. Um, so that is uh, certainly a regulatory hurdle that would um, need to be met. Um, I do think that based, based on the Conservation Commission's um, statement on it, um, which generated a lot of concern, um, if we're asking the question of uh, the chicken or the egg, if this project is the egg and the Conservation Commission is the chicken, I would say that we probably put, we should probably put the chicken before the egg in this case, right? We shouldn't go forth with this vote and get this whole ball rolling when we know that there is a pretty significant um, regulatory hurdle um, that that needs to be that needs to be passed. And I, I do wonder if Drew's suggestion that okay, well, then, if it costs $100,000 to, to just do the engineering on it, that we find a way to get that plane done first, and then put that before um, our, and we also, I want to point out and I, I am remiss in that I only recently uh, found out about the existence of this committee, but there is a groundwater protection committee uh, that is sort of renascent. It was only formed recently and their new mission statement was approved by the select board um, just a week or two ago. Uh, but that is yet another uh, committee that I think is relevant that, uh, you know, I, I think with a full engineering plan placed in front of the Board of Health, the Conservation Commission and the groundwater protection committee, I think we would get a lot more valuable input to uh, uh, hopefully assuage the fears or uh, at least, um, you know, alter the plan of the people that have environmental concerns, you know, myself included. Um, so that would, that, that would be, that would be something that I think would be worth exploring. Um, but I believe everybody from advisory has um, had a chance to weigh in. Um, we do have some uh, public commenters uh, lined up. Uh, I'm going to open up the second round of public comment. Um, I do, I know that uh, while advisory was discussing both uh, Daryl Beardsley and Carol McGarry had popped in and out of uh, raise hands. So if they still have things that they want to say, I would like to um, recognize them first. Um, so 
uh, either Daryl or or Carol, if you want to go, go ahead. Daryl, why don't you go first? It's going to say the same thing. So, uh, where to begin? A couple things. I guess the question of there seem to be a lot of uncertainties and ifs about the risks. I think it's more the magnitude of risk. There is risk. We know that study after study, EPA study, EPA reviewed study, studies around the world, educational institutes, institutions, all sorts have all come up with the same thing that there are at least a hundred toxic chemicals present in crumb rubber. It can leach out. When you crumb the rubber, it leaches out more than if it was a solid surface. Hence my reference earlier to just do a solid surface, no grass, and I'll get to the grass in a moment. Um, and that those chemicals include carcinogens and irritants. It's just a matter of how much are you going to be exposed to. But so when we're talking about the infill alternatives, all we're talking about is looking at crumb rubber or a variant of that. But the emerging information about PFAS in the grass and in the mat that holds the grass together is what's got people alarmed. And PFAS is, it is worse than asbestos in the opinion of most toxicologists. This is something that if the Bottled Water Association thinks five parts per trillion is what they wanna aim for in their product, then I think that shows what, what the scientific information is that's emerging. And the, the thought that the PFAS, right, might be measured as certain PFASs are no longer present, but there are thousands of varieties. So when a problem is encountered with one, uh, and again, this chemical is added to the plastic because it serves a real purpose in manufacturing. You need some other thing in there that will serve that purpose that can be another PFAS that's just a variant that hasn't yet been proven to be dangerous um, or proven to be safe, neither. Uh, so in industry, it's hard to make these switches quickly in production. Again, I work with manufacturing all the time. I'm actively working with manufacturers on these kinds of issues. And so it, they can't just suddenly cease using it. So it will be present in different forms and then we're gonna be chasing after it. Um, uh, Darryl, trying to identify sorry, the hazards of each one. So, so they are, yeah, sorry, it's, <laughs> this is why our discussion went on for two hours. You get two minutes, <laughs> it's, two minutes. Okay. It is complicated on the um, disposal costs since I've been talking to folks about what it takes to destroy these things because no one's going to want to recycle and reuse something that has PFAS in it. And that is going to be very expensive, I would guess, upwards of $1,000 a ton. Thank you. Carol? Yeah, I, I'm going to speak briefly and then I, I, I think Michael Lesser might add to my comments, but I did want to respond to the comment that presumably uh, CONCOM monitors these wetlands. There are wetlands all over town, lots of wetlands. And um, so CONCOM is not able to monitor all the wetlands in town. So in fact, if this were installed, we would have to have create a special monitoring project for it. Um, the second thing that I think that's very important to think about with monitoring is once you have hundreds of tons of this on the ground um, and it starts getting released into groundwater and you detect it, by that point, it's kind of a, a done deal. It's there it's, and it could continue, it would continue to migrate. So the problem with monitoring is it's like after the, uh, the horse is out of the barn, you know, monitoring doesn't prevent problems. It just tells you there are problems. And I wanted to just quickly note how interconnected those wetlands are. Um, the wetlands there have a brook that goes down to India, contributes to Indian Brook, which travels down past Everett Street um, into Little Farm Pond through Broadmoor. We, there's a big, big wetland complex there. We don't know exactly how this would migrate. But we do know that some of those areas have abutters and have neighbors um, that have wells. So again, you know, the need to really 
study this carefully before we commit. And then um, I, I would suggest calling on Michael because he may also have been wanting to respond to that comment. Thank you. Michael, Michael was next anyway, so go ahead. And you're uh, muted, Michael. Yes, for the 10,000th time. Um, first, I'll speak Michael Lesser as a conservation commissioner. And um, uh, Carol said most of it. I just want to add something to what you, Steve, said about that. Um, that even though this, this would come before the uh, Conservation Commission, um, probably under an NOI process, the, there are still environmental issues that go beyond what the commission has purview about. So therefore I would, uh, take, I'm not sure how much you were pushing this point that, that the full environmental risks issues will not be always all captured by a Wetland Protection Act uh, review process. Um, so therefore people, should not rely on just what is covered there as addressing all of the, the risks that are to come um, in this project um, or under this project. I'll stop there. Um, as to conservation, I'll just say as a resident, I guess what I've learned today is that I'm wondering to what extent this project and the issue of artificial turf is so driven by playing standards of maybe more, I don't know if it's the more elite groups or what, that, that having a turf field is needed to be competitive within certain groups, which is so that to the extent that the whole idea of even natural turf, um, however, and well-managed and organic or, or close to, is less of, a, of, a, of an option for those people who feel strongly about the need for artificial turf for a certain kind of performance play an experience that they want their kids to have uh, versus I would say to extent the majority of maybe uh, kids in our town or in my case, my family was less concerned about that kind of premier experience um, there. And so I'm wondering to what extent the alternative option will be is really something that recreation wants to consider given those kind of demands for that kind of field experience um, and to what extent just having good fields in general for the maybe the majority of kids is not necessarily going to get its uh, full attention, um, whereas the focus is more on this kind of premier experience um, that kids have, and Thanks. so it's it up, raised Michael? that concern. Nope, that's it. I'll stop there. Hey, hey Steve, can I ask a follow up, make a comment, and a follow up question to those statements? Yep. Thank you. Um, so, Daryl. I feel like the comments that you made um, just moments ago, um, and I don't need a response here, but I'd just like to point out the comments you made moments ago, um, maybe you're making them as a private citizen, certainly have a different tone to them than the letter that the Board of Health uh, made available to advisory as we were first thinking about, about this. The letter seemed to imply that there was no actually hard data to push in one direction or the other or make a, to make a vote in one direction or the other. And, the question I have, I guess, is that if these um, artificial fields are so bad for the environment, I just have a hard time understanding how they're even allowed anywhere. Are there other, are there other um, towns that are callous about the health of their children and the people who attend? I, it just, I recognize that there are potential um, that there are potential problems with these type of fields, just like there are potential problems with fertilizers that everyone uses on their grass, but. Um, it seems to me that we're very focused on the potential negativity of this. Um, and that it's just unclear, it's unclear to me that the data has shown that is as bad as is, is being made to seem. Uh, thanks, Daryl, since Steve uh, addressed you directly, I'll let you um, respond to that, but I would just ask that you keep your comments limited to responding to what Steve said. First, uh, so my last comments, although maybe again, I'll have some personal, my last comments were based on the Board of Health discussion. It was very lengthy, as I mentioned. Our statements really came out on the physical, the musculoskeletal impacts and others were very difficult to, to come up with something definitive. That one was more of a, it's a draw different studies come up with different things and it's too situational to know exactly. 
and it's a very complex data set. And so we really, uh, even to envision how someone would be able to analyze it precisely and come up with an answer is difficult. We were not neutral on that this will have an environmental impact. The question is how big of an impact and how much risk. And then risk starts to bring in financial considerations and others. And so, and it's what the risk tolerance is and it will definitely increase risk, but by how much we can't say, nobody can say. And that's why these things are so difficult to do. And frankly, some of the information coming out is fairly recent. And so it hasn't always been studied and vetted and what have you. Um, and then, yeah, and then the other is my personal perspective on how we make those decisions about those risks. And the people who will be bearing the risk from this may not be the same group who is the beneficiaries. And that's a tough thing, I think, for a town. And as Board of Health, we felt it was important to let people know that there would be some risk. And that's what I'm trying to convey. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl, for confirming that the risk is tough to be quantified as you wrote in the Board of Health letter. Thank you. Um, we do have several people lined up. Um, I do ask people are starting to get antsy in both the public and private chat. Um, so I ask that um, if you are waiting to comment that please only comment if you have new information and if you are simply reiterating um, your previous position or the position of somebody else that you refrain. Uh, so please new comments only or new information only. Uh, but I believe Chris Brown, you were next up. Thank you, Steve. You know, um, I think what Dow was talking a lot about is the need to be cautious in, about what we do, especially environmentally. Um, if we screw up the water wells of North Main Street, Everett Street, Rockwood Street, maybe even to the Dallas Orchard, the cost to the town, which is not in any kind of forecast provided by recreation, will be the cost of connecting the town to the MWRA system, laying down piping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That would be massive, horrifying cost that I don't think any of us uh, will recover from for many years financially. There's also a lot of soft costs associated with this. You know, there's a cost of time and effort of conservation and board of health, et cetera, in monitoring anything that goes on any well in town. Um, there's no effort to discuss the issue of traffic that this would create, 190 odd vehicles coming in every hour or so to this facility would create traffic. I've heard of many, heard many accidents from my house of people pulling out onto 27. It's the police and fire department inevitably will be involved as a cost there. There's no cost to trying to improve the idea by taking a moment to pause, reflect, improve um, what you know people in recreation have trying, been trying to do for 20 odd years. Um, this uh, do something to improve Laurel. I'm still a referee. I referee a lot of youth sports, particularly from high school type ages upwards. And, you know, so I am still remaining involved in the town in, in, at that level. So I, I would appreciate what Drew was saying about uh, giving some more time to study. Perhaps some of the people that uh, Dave has who's willing to fundraise can participate in the cost of a, a deeper study to really get into this, to get in more greater detail, it, now, especially with future town meetings coming up um, six months after 20 years of work, isn't going to be much of a delay to talk about, to get something really nailed down good properly and uh, the way that Thank you, Chris, wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Dave Goldberg. I just have a question because we talked about the fact that this area is not monitored, but it is right next to the town landfill. Um, and I'm just wondering whether conservation committee or, or Sean Clean or anyone has any um, information about how we are actively monitoring uh, that area. Uh, does anyone from conservation or Sean have an answer to that? 
I know that we do monitor, um, and I'm going to let Michael jump in too. I know we do monitor the um, the golf course right next to. But Michael, do you know if we if there's any monitoring of the town dump? No, there's no monitoring there. It's it's quite expensive to do that kind of monitoring, um, and therefore, in general, so as has been brought up before, so there's no active monitoring. What are you monitoring on the golf course? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, there were uh, there are basically some chemical uses that they're going on on the golf course for some pesticides that they okay. uh, that they apply, and they're supposed to have done. And some of the parts of the course that are in the, closer to Sherborne or in Sherborne are supposed to be managed organically as part of the original uh, order of conditions, which is the permit for under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so closer areas were to be managed organically and not have pesticides applied there. So, so, so there's some monitoring on the on the golf course side, or at least for for some of the contaminants from potential uh, contaminants from from uh, that, the pesticides and and fertilizer and so forth. Yes, there's some there in some selected sites. It's it's key to what's called sensitive receptors, um, and I'm not sure. I can't remember since the. the uh, I can't remember exactly where they have those particular monitoring wells. And it hasn't, and that testing doesn't include some of the stuff. It's doesn't include maybe some of it's it's keyed. Doing the monitoring is, is expensive, and therefore the testing that has to be done is keyed to just specific what we're looking for, like a specific pesticide and such. So that, for example, some of the possible uh, contaminants that might come from a uh, artificial turf. Are, are not being are not being tested for because uh, that's fairly expensive uh, to do any to key testing to those particular constituents. So therefore, it would be something of whether maybe uh, right we have to go see where that is and to what extent we need to try to establish a baseline or something like that. If it's if they're in relevant sites, could be something to be talking about. Right. And I think the other thing is, you know, the flow of ground of water doesn't necessarily go in that direction. I mean, there would have to be an analysis to figure out the right place to put monitoring. Mm -hmm. True. Thank Good you. Point. Sean, did you have sure. more to add? Yeah, we do annual um, testing and monitoring for the for the permit of the cap landfill. So there's six monitoring wells around the landfill and we do monitor that and have to uh, send that data to DEP every year. There's numerous chemicals leaching from under the landfill, so obviously we track that. So there are where do you know where those chemicals are going? Yeah, as part of the permit, they had they had to establish where the ground flow, what direction the ground flow is. Um, so we so we do know the ground flow at least. Well, we know the groundwater flow from the from the transfer station for sure. Right, and and there's chemicals in it already. Significant chemicals in it already. Yeah, obviously, there's chemicals from under a landfill. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, I know the discussion is starting to drag on. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, chatter about wrapping this up, and we also have some requests to take some of the capital items out of order before lunch for uh, relevant reasons. Um, so what I'd like to do, I don't want to um, totally stop public comment, but I do feel like based on uh, the first round of advisory comments that um, there aren't a lot of undecideds on advisory. And so I consider that further public comment right now is unlikely to alter the vote that uh, advisory has. Um, so what I would ask is, um, if you feel that what you have to say is actually quite important to advisory and is likely to change how advisory votes on this article, that you may re keep your hand up. Um, if you are simply trying to gather more support from the general public for this article, um, I would ask that you um, lower your hands. Just give a few seconds for people to decide what you are doing. So Steve, I am undecided. May I ask a question? Sure. Maybe someone can answer the question. Is is uh, I saw somewhere that the potential impact from, you know, really cars driving and the rubber hitting the road could be, you know, equal to or even more than such an artificial turf field. Is that truly the case? Again, I'm, like from my perspective, I'm trying to assess the risk. Like, um, you know, we're in a town where we value the. Uh, you know the the environment and so on and so 
um, yeah. So is, 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 is it true? Does anyone can, can address that? Uh, if anybody can address that very narrow question, please speak up right now. This is uh, Tom Trainer. Can I uh, make a stab? Yes, please. Uh, and I'm a uh, analytical chemist, and I uh, follow uh, the field for pollutants at low levels. Uh, there's very interesting recent studies on that very question. And uh, tires uh, have hundreds of uh, special additives in them. Uh, it's incredible te tire technology today. Uh, some of the components are now be found in uh, in uh, water uh, surface water. Uh, the, the industry term now is tire wear particles, and uh, they're showing some effects. And uh, I would caution the town, the crumb rubber is recycled tires, which essentially is concentrating uh, uh, you know, thousands of tires into a field with, with those constituents that uh, could affect groundwater. So that's just one, uh, my interpretation of some of these uh, very recent, recent studies. Thank you. So, so. So, sorry, Tom. I didn't, um, if you don't mind, I, di I didn't uh, understand the the the, uh, the answer. So, is it? Are you saying that in a turf field, the the, the material is concentrated? But I, I guess I'm trying to understand for us, or specifically to the abutters, right? Is is there going to be more impact from a turf field than, let's say, really the 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 uh, the release that happens every day when tires are driving on roads or things like that. That's, that's what I'm trying to. Yeah, no. I'm sorry. I, I would say that's completely unknown. Well, seem I would, I would just say that that question points to the, the need for more study and, and, you know, the, uh, we don't know, which I think is was the conclusion of conservation commission. There needs to be more analysis yeah but to be fair if we say more study i mean this study needs to be done by researchers you know this is not something that the you know, we're not going to know the result for another 20 years to be honest like if if um it's with anything there's risk and and, and uh and we need to put the risk in perspective that's that's really what i'm trying to get at uh, to try to you know give an opinion. No, I suspect that some aspects of this are accessible to quicker study and some will take longer and there's a lot of ongoing research all the time. And this is Michael saying that right part of what you see in other towns is where they're waiting to see that there is ongoing work elsewhere in, uh, in the country as well as let's say new work by EPA. And the question is to what and other towns have elected to just sort of put a pause um, to see what the results of that kind of work is. Um, and as you say, right, we're not gonna be doing that stuff. It's, it's a matter of to what extent other stuff gets accomplished because the things are underway. Um, such as stuff even in California where they've, you can see the beginning studies where they've done hundreds of hours of videotaping kids playing on fields and seeing how many times they touch their mouth, their face uh, and things like that. And they haven't finished the work about whether they have see any exposure problems with that or not. Um, so there is a bit of work that's ongoing and it's, and right, it's that tricky issue of, uh, of how much you wanna wait versus you need it now, um, as well as, and how cautious you wanna be. Uh, about this, whether you want to compare it to roads or you want to, or people, other people feel like it's still one more contributing factor. Um, so that there's different views about what you call relative risk. Thank you. And can I just mention another techie fact, science fact? Uh, yes, is it new information that you think is going it to It is slightly <laughs> different. <laughs> Thank you. So, PFAS qualifies as a persistent bioaccumulative toxin. It's a class of chemicals, lead, mercury, PFAS, bunch of other things fall into it where 
it's not something where you get exposed and you're instantly affected by it. Like if you spilled acid on your skin or something, it's, it builds up, it's persistent. It stays pretty much in its form while it's in the environment. It doesn't break down uh, necessarily or not fast. They're calling PFAS the forever chemicals. Bioaccumulate means every time you encounter that chemical and it, it becomes part of you, you're just, it's building up over time. And so at some point it's going to trip having an effect. So you need to look at these exposures, not just as a momentary thing, but as what happens over time and all the different exposures. So this is where it gets really hard. Is it riskier? Well, the tires driving on the roads are already there, but lots of artificial turf fields are around also. I feel like it's a much bigger discussion on what kind of level of risk do we want to enter into and how do we balance that with alternatives that are known to be safer, but yes, you will lose out on some of the performance. But there, in answer to an earlier question Steve, I think had, there is plenty of information from Marblehead and Springfield and uh, Duke University and lots of other sources about what it costs to maintain an organically uh, managed natural grass field. And so then it becomes a, can we find some kind of compromise that is in between that accomplishes a lot for both sides? And we haven't had that kind of discussion yet, I don't believe. Thank you. George, you've been waiting for a while. All right. Um, yeah, just one very quick thing that <clears throat> I don't think was pointed out. I know Craig mentioned it briefly, but the new fields would be ADA compliant. And as a select board, we've talked many times about having more ADA compliancy for our public spaces around town. Uh, right now on Laurel Fields, if there was a handicapped parent, they wouldn't even be able to go out and watch their kids. Uh, I think that's an important factor with these fields that they're AD, ADA compliant, not only for the players, but also for parents who are out there as spectators. And I think we need to make sure that kind of space is available to everybody. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna call th three more, but again, I ask you to try to be brief and restrict your comments to only new information and not rehashing things that have already been said. So Gavin, then Craig, then Frank. Real quick regarding traffic flow patterns, I know there was a question about that possibly from the board. Uh, because we are not increasing the footprint of the fields at all, the number of games being played at the same time or practices does not change. Uh, and so the traffic flow patterns would not be any different than it currently would be for, for current you know, weekends or, or days of practice and games. So there's no change to that at all. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, touch base on a few of the comments about uh, the, the number of in-town kids and the type of players that the turf would benefit. So um, in, uh, in DS soccer uh, from Pine Hill, there are 185 kids that are enrolled. So that's nearly half of the Pine Hill uh, enrollment. Um, and that's just soccer alone. So I think, you know, a large majority of kids uh, in town would benefit from this. Um, the other thing is that, you know, DS soccer and the other in-town sports, uh, they're all no cut sports, okay? So this is every kid that's in that program would uh, benefit from a, a turf, turf field. They'd all be playing on it. Um, for DS Soccer, I can speak from our perspective, we would move certain programs to the turf, to a turf field if it were available. And it, and it would go to the benefit of all of those kids, no matter what level they're playing at. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Frank. Just, just real quickly, just a thought. It basically what we're, what a turf field looks like is you have this mat with the with the grass sticking out of it, and then you put the um, the, the, the shredded rubber on top of that, and that sits on top of a a rock, kind of a porous um, situation to allow the water to drain, so that there's that you know that, that good um, the, the loss of water, you know, getting rid of the water off the field, so that the uh, things don't rise and and all of that. Uh, if if that were placed on a cement um, pillar instead of just on ground, and then below that below that cement pillar, that pad, so to speak, 
there was a collection tank to collect this water so that um, the water wouldn't go out and, and destroy the environment. Would that be a potential thought of a, a, of a solution to minimize the, the, the effect of the environment? Just, just as a thought of trying to think out of the box. I, I don't know if there's any solutions like that, if any of the, you know, the bigger uh, stadiums and so on have and, and use a, that kind of a technique in, in taking care and using their turf fields. Thank you. Um, I don't. I don't believe we're going to answer that, as I think it's outside of the scope of what this uh, hearing is about. Um, I, Paul. I, I see two Paul Derenses, one with video and one without. And Paul, your your non-video feed has your hand up. Is that? Did you actually want to speak? Yes, I just wanted to make a legal comment. Uh, advisory is not limited to the text of the article. So if you're inclined, if advisory is inclined to support this, you can impose conditions. Like one of the concerns that you raised was who's going to select the material. And one of the conditions that you can impose if you're inclined to support this would be to specify that there would be approval by more than just the Conservation Commission, by identifying who you wanted to have a chance to review the makeup of the materials. So what I'm suggesting to you is that if you were inclined to take action on this thing, it's, it doesn't have to be exactly as set forth in the article, you can put a whole series of conditions that address environmental issues and make sure that they will be addressed as part of any action that advisory takes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I think, unfortunately, Michael, I think I'm gonna use my uh, executive power and I'm gonna, I'm gonna post public comment because I don't, I, I don't believe that the, uh, the benefit of additional discussion is worth, worth the, uh, the time. Um, so I'm closing public comments uh, and I'm opening the voting session. Um, can I get a motion from advisory regarding Article 9 authorization for design and construction of a turf field at Laurel Farm? Uh, sure. So I move we recommend favorable action on Article 9 in which the town will vote to raise $1 million for construction of the turf field at Laurel Farm, uh, contingent upon the Recreation Committee first raising $3 million for, from private donations and to establish a stabilization fund for the maintenance of the field. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table for favorable action. Any advisory discussion? All right, hearing no discussion, I'm gonna call the, uh, the vote. Jane Matarazzo? Nay. Stephen Leahy? Aye. Peter Galatano? Aye. Brendan Daly? Aye. Wasim Basili? Uh, aye. Natalie Weir? Nay. Mark Albers? Aye. Drew Cashel? Nope. And I am also a no. Motion passes 5 4. All right. I would like to call a five minute bathroom break, um, and then we will have some logistical uh, questions afterwards as uh, people have been asking to take some capital items out of order. So, five minute bathroom break. <laughs> I believe Brendan is the only one um, who is still uh, 
not back, um, but it has been five minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to Article 10, Capital Improvement Plan. Um, we do have a few, I sort of wanna do some uh, logistical uh, things. So there've been many <laughs> uh, requests uh, to me in the chat that we take a couple of the capital items out of order as um, many people have been waiting for a long time to, uh, to discuss specific articles. Um, those, the first request was from uh, Council on Aging to discuss the uh, Senior Center Architectural Study as uh, many of the COA um, associated uh, people have been waiting for a long time. Uh, and then the second one is um, Article 6, uh, sort of Item 6, Woodhaven and Leland Farms public water supply, um, as we do have town council present on um, this call um, to aid in any of the discussion on that. Um, and we are uh, uh, paying for uh, council. So it, uh, as a cost to the town, it makes sense to take that earlier. Um, I don't want a great deal of discussion from advisory on this. So I'm mostly gonna call the vote unless uh, you have any major objections to taking these out of order. What I would propose is that we do Article 7, uh, Council on Aging, then Article 6, the uh, of the water supply. Um, we would then break for lunch and then take the remainder of the capital items in order after lunch. Um, so briefly, if anybody from advisory has a serious objection to that, um, give you a chance to speak. <clears throat> Uh, but otherwise, I'll take a motion to take the capital improvement items out of order as I had um, outlined. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion and second to take the capital items out of order. It will be seven, then six, then we'll take lunch, and then we'll take the rest of the capital items in order. Uh, roll call vote. Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Stephen Leahy. Steve, Steve might not be back yet. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basili. Uh, Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Kashau. Aye. And Steve, did you catch that conversation? We're taking capital out of order. Uh, aye, no problem. All right, uh, motion passes 9-0. Um, all right, so we're moving on to Article 10, which is the Capital Improvement Plan to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds or borrow pursuant to any applicable statute a sum or sums of money, and if so, what sum or sums for the purpose of capital expenditures of the town of Sherburne, and to determine if any amount borrowed under this article shall be contingent upon the passage of a ballot question, exempting the amounts required to pay for the bonds from the provisions of Proposition 2.5, or take any action relative thereto. Um, and I should note for advisory members that um, we should also uh, move whether the um, amount is to come from pre-cash or from excluded debt. Um, all right, so we're going to begin with Article 7, um, COA Architectural Study for a Senior Center in the amount of $40,000. Um, I believe Chris Winterfeld is here to um, present. And uh, Chris, you can share your screen if you'd like, um, and you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so Chris Winterfeld for Old Orchard Road. Um, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Council on Aging uh, Committee. And... Um, we would like, as, as Stephen said, cited, uh, to, we're asking for $40,000 for a feasibility study for um, a senior center. And I think that the reason we are looking for that is because we wanted to get an objective outside party to help us with our goal and uh, of getting a senior center one day here in town. Uh, we have looked for many, many years and hoped for a senior center and we hope that this might be a path to seeing that to fruition. Uh, we have, uh, I did some, uh, quite a bit of research. Our whole committee has done quite a bit of research, I should say. And we found an architectural firm that has done, uh, among other things, quite a bit of feasibility studies specifically for senior centers. Uh, some of the towns that they have uh, worked on in Massachusetts are Falmouth, Andover, Chester, Mass, Situate, Mass, Pembroke, and Sturbridge. Uh, the consultant has given me several bullet points that I can tell you about. 
that would involve the scope of the feasibility study. And those would include uh, one, an executive summary that would give voters a one page summary of the project. Two, a space, uh, space uh, uh, media program. Uh, this, this is how large is your building and what is inside of it. This would include meeting with the staff and reaching out to the community at large to determine our needs and our wants. Then three, building the floor plan. This is required to, te to test the sites and determine if the building will, be, will fit on a certain site and would it need to be two stories in order to fit on the site. Uh, this, this is just a brief summary. Uh, four, site analysis, building orientation, parking access. Uh, they would do this included in the 40,000 for up to three separate sites if we would like that. Uh, the town, any, any of the sites the town is considering that would include a piece of land, that would include uh, perhaps a, a building that we would like to have uh, renovated into a, possibly renovated into a senior center. Uh, the, the final product is a preliminary site plan with site constraints, such as water, sewer, distance from the town center. Uh, then fifth, they will do a, a traffic and parking analysis. Uh, sixth, a cost estimate for construction of the building and the site. Then seven, a total project cost estimate for what needs to be funded at the town meeting. This includes buildings and site costs, as well as all the other costs associated, like design fees, moving, outfitting, the kitchen, buying furniture, and things like that. Then eighth, the implementation schedule. That is, what are the next steps? How long will they take? And when would the building be finished? That's, that's basically the overview, very, very briefly and concisely. And that, the name of the, oh, I'll tell you the name of the architectural firm, which is located in Boston, is Bargman, Hendry, and Archetype. They are, of course, would be coming to the uh, town meeting and can do an entire presentation with slides, et cetera. So that's what we're asking for. Um, and I, I ask that you give us your approval, please. We've got thank about you, Chris. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, um, all right, I did. Sorry, Eric, I only noticed uh, afterwards that your hand is up, but we have uh, Eric Johnson and then Jeff Aldrin have comments. Sure. I'm just going to report our vote. On uh, March 4th of this year, the select board voted uh, 400 to support this article. Thank you. Jeff? I'm just as quick, uh, uh, maybe other people were on a bit. Uh, Christina had the um, consultant present the select board and I was very impressed with um, his approach. So uh, I thought it was um, a good choice. Thank you. Um, I would like to open the floor to uh, public comments on uh, the COA uh, architectural study. This is Trisha Caldicott, and I just would... okay. Can I just ask that you use uh? Can you use the raise hand feature um just okay. so that I can recognize you? <laughs> okay. Because there's too many there's too many people on screen, Sorry. but okay. but yes, go ahead and you just can you just uh, identify yourself and and you can go ahead. I'm I'm trying to find the raised hand feature, so yeah, don't worry. This is more of a general comment. You're you're I you've already been recognized now, so just okay. go ahead and. This is Trisha Caldicott. I'm vice chair on the Council on Aging. I've been involved with the COA for several years and um, a lot of effort and energy has brought us to this point. It's been consistent, a great deal of research by many members, many stakeholders, and we very much appreciate the select board support over the last few months. And um, we I would just uh, urge um, the advisory to lend its support as well. I think it's a very worthwhile project, and this this is a, a, a very reasonable cost for a wide range of services that would give us a, a very uh, good, uh, well-researched 
um, and credentialed uh, review of the sites that we're looking at. And um, I think the town would be very well served by this project, this, this request, and then potentially. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional public comments? Right, seeing none, I'm closing public comments and opening up uh, advisory uh, discussion. Any comments or questions from advisory? Um, I do have I do have one question. Um, so uh, presumably this would be a, a feasibility study, and then subsequently there would be a proposal for sort of a project. Um, uh, sorry, there's a lot there's of there's feedback from whoever iPhone eighty nine is. Can you mute yourself? Um, so uh, I, I assume that the subsequently the project. Would have to would that have to go through a uh, state bid process or would it be this same uh, firm that would be uh, performing the the work? Uh, Stephen, this is David Williams. Yeah, uh, town administrator. Um, they do not need to hold um, another uh, another procurement process than what they already did, which was to go out and seek. Uh, seek three acceptable quotes. So they've already looked for um, businesses that do this work and have under the law chosen the um, businesses that they were willing to do work with. And this is the response that they um, received as the most advantageous response. So. The, the procurement process really is all over. It will just be okay. a contracting negotiating issue. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it raises uh, for me, I, I support this project. Um, I think that the feasibility study is the very much the logical first step. I think I was very hesitant every time that I heard uh, sort of discussions of, oh, COA wants to do this, wants to purchase this building and turn it into a senior center. Oh, COA wants to do um, a design for the uh, a particular property on town campus. And I'm like, we, uh, we have not actually explored all the options yet. And I, I believe that that is what this um, project is trying to address, right? Is to explore all of the options, which I think is the, the very good logical first step. My only concern, which is why I raised the um, the bid process, is that you know this the feasibility study is being performed by a firm which also designs and builds senior centers. So, you know, there is some version of a conflict of interest there, right? Because, I mean, I, I will not be surprised when the recommendation from a design and build firm is that we design and build a new senior center. Um, so, so that's my only sort of uh, vague um, uh, uh, qualm about this. Um, but, but it's to me, it's not enough to say we shouldn't do this. I think I just wanted to express my concern about that aspect. Um, but um, does anybody from advisory have have any comments? All right, hearing none, I'd like to reopen. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Steve, I was just gonna make go a ahead, comment Steve. that uh, if, if the Council on Aging says that uh, we would like to have a, uh, a uh, uh, center, then I am in support of that, <laughs> regardless of what the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 sorry, the people were uh, hiring will say, uh, I think the, 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 the opinion of the Council of Aging matters more to me i think so i'm mean, meaning i'm i'm in support of you know of uh hiring this entity regardless of you know the fact that they will likely come back and say we you know we we will uh want to have a senior center thank you uh all right any other advisory comments 
Uh, if not, I'd like to close advisory comments and open up second uh, public commentary period. Um, Alicia Goody has got her hand up. Alicia, you can go ahead. Uh, you're you're muted. If there you go. can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, I uh, did not realize I put my hand up. I'm sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> no problem. All right. Otherwise, uh, any additional public comments? All right, seeing none, I'm closing public comments and opening the voting session. Can I get a, a motion on the uh, article, uh, article 10, number seven, uh, which is the COA Architectural Study Senior Center in the amount of $40,000? Uh, I move favorable action on um, article 10.7, the $40,000 Architectural Study for a Senior Center for the um, Center Coalition on Aging. Second. Second. All right, any advisory discussion? And I should remind you that we um, should make a determination as to whether this will be excluded debt or if this is going to be um, free cash. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure actually, I don't know if one of the uh, uh, municipal lawyers on here can let me know, but does that need to be in our motion currently or only in our motion at town meeting? Okay, Paul, go ahead. Uh, you're, and you're muted, Paul. Hi. Uh, it's always good to tell the voters in advance, but you can say to be determined at town meeting. That's okay. a, 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 you are going to have to make a decision in the motion at town meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. So as part of the advisory discussion right now, um, I guess, uh, can we make a determination as to whether this will be free cash or if this is going to be um, excluded debt? Uh, my preference would be excluded debt because we are, I believe, trying to um, not use free cash when, whenever possible, and uh, interest rate rates are good right now. Um, but certainly, I think we can amend our motion uh, before we vote on it to to make this uh, excluded debt. Steve, I would suggest that we table that until we have more information on. Um, other funding that may or may not come from the federal government. And that would change the dynamics of cash flow and funding for some of these capital items and other operating items. Do you know, are we likely have an answer on that prior to town meeting? I, I don't know. Okay. Um. But so then your suggestion would be at like Paul said to say to be determined at town meeting. Yes. Okay. Any other advisory discussion on this? Um, all right. I know, although it's his advisory, uh, I, Jeff has here his hand up. So I'm going to recognize you. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. I just have my former advisory hat on. We, we use in, in prior years, we, never decided free cash or uh, bonding until after the advisory public hearing because we didn't get free cash certified usually to early April and George Morrow can can back me up on this probably so we would um, then when you write up the warrant article with the advisory recommendation you would have it in the write-up or which how you're going to yeah. be funding it but we didn't typically know at the advisory public hearing which way we were going to go because we also didn't know how many would pass or not pass also so um, Good point. I think you can have it not have to do it live at the uh, advisory at the uh, public uh, town meeting but you could do it between now and then okay thank you Mary Wolf uh, yes I just wanted to say that we will be having a motions meeting uh, prior to town meeting and that is typically when the final determination of the motion and that will contain the funding source is made and so um, advisory can meet prior to that so that you can represent advisory's decision on what they want to finally recommend in their motion at town meeting. 
Okay, sounds good. Eric Johnson. Yeah, just to go on what Jeff said, Jeff talked, um, you mentioned that uh, usually after the hearing, you set where there's free cash or bond. But on those other years, you also were allowed to set the the um, the ballot questions afterwards. We've already set our ballot questions, correct? And uh, did the ballot questions remind me, they conservatively pretty much have all these articles on just to be safe. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay. So it should be moved. All right. Thank you. So then it sounds like we don't actually need to make that determination for each of the capital. Um, so I think we probably do not need to amend our current motion. Um, so uh, the motion is on the table for favorable action for um, for this uh, project. Uh, any additional advisory discussion before vote? All right, hearing none, I'd like to take a vote. Uh, Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Steve Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Brendan Daly. Aye. Wasim Basili. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. Drew Koshal. Aye. And I'm also an I. Motion passes 9 0. All right, now we're going to take Article 10, number six, uh, which is for the Select Board and DPW Woodhaven and Leland Farms public water supply improvements uh, in the amount of $198,000. Uh, and is uh, Sean, are you presenting this one? I am. I'm going to attempt to screen share. Can you see that? Uh, yes. All right, I, I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, in 2019, the trustees at Leland Farms came to the town, came to the select board um, asking for some assistance. They had been having uh, problems with, with the corrosion. Uh, in other words, copper leaching into the water at Leland. That's a similar problem Woodhaven had had over the years. Uh, Woodhaven actually had the lead and copper. So at that time, the select board committed to uh, working with Whitewater, who operates both public water supplies, and, and coming up with a solution. Um, the, I didn't put it in here, but there was a multiple uh, demand letters from DEP that something be done uh, to implement a corrosion control uh, strategy, which which is a complicated way of saying they need to start doing some chemical addition to change the pH of the water. A um, couple other bullet points. These, they're two separate public water supplies. Technically, they're on the same piece of property um, because Leland was built at least partially on town property that's the same parcel as uh, Woodhaven. And the well to Leland, most people don't realize, is actually behind um, the Woodhaven uh, complex behind one of the buildings. So we worked with um, Whitewater, sorry, I'm trying to change the slides to, oh, that's too big, uh, who hired a, a company called Onsite, which did some engineering and looking at the two different uh, public water supplies and working with DEP to uh, to assess whether this, the systems could be combined. Uh, this is just some data that they pulled up. Obviously, the, they track the data um, continuously. You can see that um, in 13, sorry, 14, 15, 16, there was issues over at, at Woodhaven with uh, the copper, with the lead. And then on the right, you can see Leland. Anytime there's an asterisk, you're above the limit. Uh, just for reference, if this was a, a well at a residence, and, and someone submitted this to the Board of Health, the Board of Health wouldn't allow this water, uh, th they wouldn't permit this, this well as a new well. Um, here's just some more data uh, showing the, the, the pH. pH is what causes um, corrosivity in the water. It causes the water to, to actually basically eat the pipes and any of the plumbing equipment. That's where the copper, that's where the lead comes from. It's not, it's not coming from the ground. It's attacking the plumbing 
while it's there and, and Woodhaven residents and the management can tell you that they've been struggling with water heaters for years and, that, and that's why it's, the water is attacking them. Um, this is the cost breakdown uh, estimate. Of course, it's not 100% engineered yet. The, um, the engineers base this and they're working with DEP on the permitting. Um, it, it's a pretty lengthy process. This is pretty unique to take two different public water supplies and combine them. Um, but that's ongoing right now. We expect in the next several months to have approval uh, to begin the work. And we did, by the way, we did commit to DEP um, by starting this project that, that, that we would do something. That's what allowed uh, some time at least because the demand letter that, was a that, that we were reacting to had a due date of March of 2020. Uh, of course, we all know what happened in March of 2020. So there was some relief on the time that backed up the engineering because no one was working at that point. Um, but, but the town did make a commitment both to the, to the Leland residents and to DEP that we would work on this and come up with a solution. And the solution that's, that's going to be chosen is combining the two. There's, uh, there's obviously some synergies to having one, one system, uh, rather than having a, a, uh, a system that someone has to monitor in both both buildings, it's one large system. So the operator is, is, is handling one thing. It's one set of submissions uh, for the testing because that's ongoing. And just to show everyone kind of what the site looks like, there's a, it, people might wonder why we wouldn't just punch another well if the well's not very good. Well, you can see, I don't know if you can see my asterisk, there's a well, uh, sorry, that's a dry well, but there's a well, there's another well in front of the buildings. The well that's actually closest to Leland is a well that we, um, they call it well number three for Woodhaven. It hasn't been used in several years. It's uh, It's got a lot of iron and uh, I think it's, it's even harder water. And then this well back here is the well that's John, feeding can you Leland try to, right can now. Can you try to wrap up soon? Sure. I'll just show you a couple more site plans. Sorry, that, so there's the overlapping zones. Um, the wells are all within each other's zone, which would never be permitted uh, today. And that's just a reference of what it'll take to do some of the plumbing uh, work. The, up here is the state, the area where they treat all the water at Woodhaven. So they'll just combine those. Uh, uh oh, how do I get off the screen share? So that's where we stand. Um, the, we're asking for the, mon the money to be borrowed as one lump um, to do the work, which we expect will happen this this calendar year, uh, most definitely in this fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, all right, I'd like to open comment first. Uh, Eric Johnson, I presume you're reporting a uh, select board vote on this. Yep, to report on uh, March 18th, the select board voted 400 to support this article. Thank you. All right, I'd like to open up uh, public comments on uh, this one, which is Article 10, Capital Improvements, uh, number six, uh, Woodhaven and Leland Farms Public Water Supply Improvements. Any public comments? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have one. Question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Can you can you uh, identify yourself? Yes, Frank Jenkins. Okay, I see you now. Yes. A All question. Right, go ahead. Uh, Leland Farms is a town owned uh, is a uh, privately owned uh, venture. The uh, residents there own their own units. We Leland Farms is a town owned uh, investment. Uh, the units are rented to uh, residents. Um, how would the finances here be handled between publicly owned and privately owned parties? Uh, thank you. I can I can try to to answer that. I think that um, a lot of uh, the advisory discussion will probably have to do with that. Um, um, but actually, you know what? <laughs> 
I'll if I can ask you to wait, Frank, uh, because I think a lot of advisory discussion will will cover that topic. So um, if if we don't cover uh, that that question, then um, you can you can ask again in the second round of public comments. But any additional public comments? Um, all right, seeing none, um, I would like to close public comments and open um, advisory discussion. Um, I will first try to uh, answer uh, Frank's uh, question, but we do have uh, Amanda Zaretti, who is a uh, town council here, who has been looking into this issue. So if I say anything that is totally wrong, <laughs> you can you can let me know. Um, but the um, the contract that the town has with um, Leland Farms uh, clearly states that the um, the sole financial responsibility for the the you know maintenance and replacement of the uh, wells at Leland Farms falls on Leland Farms and the the owners of the units. Um, I think that is one of the areas where um, the advisory committee has had uh, questions about this. Again, we can divide this sort of into sort of two questions, right? One is, um, should we do this project? And then number two is, um, how how is this project paid for? Um, I believe that everybody agrees that the, the answer to the first one is yes, we should do this. In fact, we, we have to do this because of the DEP's demand um, letter. Um, but the question still remains as to um, how to pay for it. And unfortunately, you know, both, both questions are wrapped up in one right now. So, um, I believe that advisory's uh, recommendation will be to uh, move favorable action on this, uh, but the project itself um, should not commence until uh, a payment agreement is reached between the town and the trustees of the farms and um, and Woodhaven to essentially come up with a plan for the debt service over the life of, of this water supply. Um, so, so, so the answer is complex, Frank, but, but essentially the payment structure is yet to be determined, but um, that will be worked out between the town and the um, interested parties um, and advisories motion now and at town meeting will simply have a contingency uh, regarding that prior to the commencement of the project. Um, and I'll, I'll look to Amanda to see if, if what I said sounds accurate <laughs> and uh, if there's anything no, it more does. you have to add. Okay. It does, and, and thanking right. you for recon recognizing me, uh, Mr. Tsai. Um, I, just one point of, of clarification. Um, you, I think that uh, Mr. Dorensis certainly is aware, as, as our members of the advisory committee, that the Leland Farms unit owners are actually unit lessees under a ground lease that endures for 99 years. And it is a correct statement that under the ground lease, the financial responsibility for the, uh, the well maintenance replacement and so forth uh, falls on the unit owners. Um, one of the discussions that the advisory committee might undertake um, at, at some point is uh, how to allocate the cost for the combination of the wells between Woodhaven and Leland. Thank you. Um, so we are currently in the advisory discussion um, portion. So uh, I will open the floor for any additional advisory comments. I'll jump in with the allocation piece. In the capital budget committee, when this capital item was brought up, the basis for allocation, which we, we came up with and suggested was the actual water use and that's metered and clearly defines the, the use between, or the historical use would clearly define and uh, predict future use under the combined system for both Leland and Woodhaven. That was the basis for that allocation. Uh, again, uh, that was under capital budget committee. And because the issues become broader now, um, that it was. Thank you. Any other discussion or comments from advisory? Is there I'm sorry, I missed the tail end of what Peter said. Um, Peter, so were there hard numbers to, um, 
between the two, Woodhaven and Leland, or no? You're saying that in general, we will take those historical numbers or, or select board will when thinking about how to pay for this? Yes, um, historically and going forward, there are metered uh, water use uh, under, the old, under the new system. And so it, it's like a 60, 40 for memories, 33 uh, Leland, uh, because there's more, you, uh, there's more use. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and to be clear, I don't, I don't believe that uh, our motion now or at town meeting um, would be specifying the exact structure and mechanism of how that payment um, agreement would go. That would still, you know, there's, you know, the, the town cannot just unilaterally say they, they have to um, have that discussion with uh, the trustees of both uh, Leland and uh, Woodhaven and basically hammer something out. We would just say, hammer that out first before you start the project. Um, um, but, but essentially, I think that advisory's concern is to just ensure that the debt service and the long-term payment of this doesn't actually fall on the residents, uh, the, the Sherborne taxpayers at large. So then that boils down to a very simple question because the ground lease and the elder housing, affordable housing, both are town assets that I believe I would support a favorable motion to raise these funds, fix water for public health, public safety, and then the division of financial responsibilities can be worked out between all three parties. Correct. All right. Um, I would like to uh, close the advisory comment Sorry, period. Steve, uh, just one question, if you don't mind. Uh, is, yeah, does go the ahead. town provide the water to uh, Leland Farm already? What do you mean by provide it? Well, is, is, it, is it a private well or is it a you know, town well? Uh, I, I guess, I yeah, guess one, one question I really have about this is, is uh, you know, it, it clear, you know, something needs to be done to address the water issue. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it sounds like we'll take care of how we divide the responsibility, the financial responsibility between the two. But I mean, is there a precedent we're doing here where we're providing, you know, water to a private, you know, entity, essentially? Uh, um, so I'm, tr I'm just trying to understand, do we as a town now provide, are we now responsible for providing the water to uh, Leland Farm, which is privately owned? And, uh, and you know, maybe also related question, do we provide water to any private entity right now in town? Uh, Sean, I believe you were going to answer that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the simple answer is we don't provide water to them. The, and they just, because of the way the land is, um, when the complex was built, the well had to be put where it is. It's on Woodhaven's property. Um, so they drilled the well when they, when they built that complex. And then they operate their own public water supply um, through their own funding. What we're doing is combining two. Woodhaven has a public water supply. Leland has one. Um, so at the time it made sense to set it up that way, but physically engineering wise now, it makes sense to combine them. Um, and, it's, and it's well laid out in the study. I didn't bore everyone with all the details, but it's well laid out why it's advantageous to do that for well yields and, and um, for the chemistry. Uh, thank you. And even though we're in the advisory comment period, I, I'm going to guess Paul has something informative to say rel relative to our advisory discussion. So you have your hand up, Paul. Yes, I was part of the team on the Board of Selectmen who helped get Leland Farms built. And I, I want to correct the notion that this is privately owned 
versus the publicly owned Woodhaven. Leland Farms was a concept that the town came up with. It's built on town land. At the end of the ground lease, this all reverts back to the town, including the, the buildings, including the water supply. It is built with town meeting votes because we wanted to have a community that was not just a wealthy suburb of Boston. We wanted a diverse community. We wanted people of all kinds of backgrounds and income levels. We wanted to be inclusive. We had to meet our affordable housing needs. And this Leland Farms contains affordable housing and does count towards our overall state mandated goals. So this is a, a public, a publicly uh, invested development. So I am suggesting that it's not a dichotomy between public and private and why are we helping the private part of this, we are maintaining our commitment to affordable housing. We are maintaining our, our commitment to a diverse community. We are maintaining our commitment that teachers and firemen and police officers and people of that type can live in the town. That not everything has to be expensive single family homes. So it's very much in the public interest to carry forward those commitments made by the town and by town meeting and by the prior select boards and continue to support Leland Farms. Thank, Thank you. you. Steve, are we in the um, any other? Yeah, no, go ahead. Portion? We are still in the advisory portion. I had recognized Paul because he's a select board member. And um, so oh, I, no, 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 that's yeah. fine. I just, I, I was going to respond to Paul's comment, but I didn't want to do that. Yeah, no, go ahead. It wasn't the appropriate time to do that. Um, and I totally agree with, with everything that Paul is saying. Um, and I think, and council can jump in if this is wrong, but, but I, I think it is also the case that all of the um, foundational agreements that were behind the building of Leland Farms clearly specify that respons financial responsibility for the water rests with Leland Farms. So I think our concern as an advisory committee is that we don't effectively transfer to the taxpayers at large a responsibility that very clearly legally is um, that of those who live at Leland Farms. That, that's, all, that's all we're trying to um, cover, I, I think. If others on advisory want to comment, feel free. No, I, I would agree with that. I think my, my goal is for this to move forward and just to move forward along the, the lines of the legal contract. Any other advisory questions or comments? All right, hearing none, I'd like to reopen public comments. Um, I believe Joey Talbert was, uh, was up first. Hi, I'm Joey Talbert. I live at Leland Farms. I'm an affordable unit holder, um, owner, and I'm also on the board of trustees at Leland Farms. Um, we, do have, we do have our own well. Um, it's one well. It, there's, it's a public water system because there's 17 units and only one well, as opposed to like Abbey Road next door, they built, I think they have three or four wells. So they don't have to do this public water supply that we have to do, which is incredibly expensive. We have to remember it's an affordable, 10 affordable units in a 17 complex, right? So 17 owners, but 10 of us are affordable. And it's not affordable because the water supply is sinking us. And so we went for help. And if you're gonna charge us to interconnect the water, you're making it worse. So are you saying we have to pay for the whole project? Or are you saying we need to pay for the, our own water use after it's done, which we're already doing now, like paying for white water and paying for all the testing, paying for everything we have to do? What are you saying? 
I think what we're saying is that uh, you know the owner, you, the owner, the unit owners at Leland are responsible for whatever the proportion is of the well system, and that includes the maintenance and repair. Um, this is basically according to um, you know the contract with the town. Now we are not already we are not saying that right now that we're determining the exact percentage uh, and how much everyone is going to pay. I think that that is something that you can negotiate with um, the select board and with Woodhaven. Um, it, you know, we, we don't have a specific recommendation as to what the proportions are. Essentially. But that, that wasn't my question. Are you charging us to interconnect it? Or are, you, or are you asking just afterwards that we continue paying for our maintenance, which we were perfectly willing to do and will do? Do you hear what I'm saying, what the question is? Um, I, I, I think I do. I don't know if Sean may be better equipped to answer that question. I don't know that the cost of this project is simply to interconnect the two systems. I think it is a combination of the, I think the DP has specific steps that they want to have taken in order mm -hmm. to, you know, remediate the, the wells. And then I think that on top of that, this entire project involves uh, combining the two systems into one. I don't know that that there are two different um, proposals, like one that maintains two separate systems versus one that has an interconnected system. Well, I Again, know I that we Sean both would have the answer. I know that okay, we both use white. We both use white water. So Leland Farms and Woodhaven both use white water as our the people we pay to maintain our systems. So when we interconnect it, white water would only have to come once rather than twice, which is should be helpful for both complexes. And we are we are expecting to pay that. We're expecting to pay the white water, all the maintenance, what we always paid for the for the system. But I need to know if you're asking us to pay for the interconnection piece of it. Because that that right, because we're trying to we're trying to keep ourselves from going bankrupt. <laughs> so that what we were trying to figure out how to solve this water problem because DAP is chart wanted us to pay twenty to thirty thousand dollars to fix our copper issue. And so we're trying to avoid that surcharge from DEP. And if we can get this four wells sorted together so that none of us have a copper issue, that will hopefully solve the DEP problem, which is I thought why we were doing this. So Sean, can you help me? Yeah, let me yeah. There's a couple things. Leland was going to have to put in a system that was at least 30, maybe as much as 50 uh, with the permitting and the install of the system. Woodhaven wasn't being forced to do it, but in all rights should also have done it. So if we stayed the course, Leland would have put in a 30 to $50,000 system. A day later, Woodhaven would have had to put the same exact system in both of which are plenty big enough to do the entire complex. And Whitewater would still have to come in and take care of both systems, monitor both systems, test both systems. So the long-term benefit is the interconnection allows one system to be installed and maintained and operated. Um, so it's, there's some, yeah, of course there's some site work in interconnecting the two. There's huge benefits to that because the biggest draw well is Leland's. Um, by a factor of three. So that you add that to the to the system, it becomes a more robust system. Everybody benefits. Um, so yeah, the, the capital expenditure benefits both upfront and it allows for a less expensive operation. The operation as a whole is gonna be more expensive because chemical addition is expensive. It has to be done. The only way out of it would be to get water from somewhere else in town because all of the wells up there need it. So we're, we're hopefully having a much, there's a small, this is a small capital price to pay for a long-term benefit cost and, and health-wise. Steve, can I help add to this? I think I can explain, I think what Joey's asking. Um, yes, go ahead. What, what, they're, what they're saying, Joey, is they're gonna, this article is gonna, um, if passed, the town would spend the $198,000 to make this improvement, but then it would be bonded. So it'll be over, you won't be paying for it all now. You'll be paid for over a number of years through debt service. And what they're asking for is that the Leland Farm residents along with the Woodhaven resident, like the, the all the residents together pay that debt service over those years, because then it's not 
all one cost up front and you're, you're the, the residents are the ones getting the benefit from it. And I, and I was just gonna put my hand down because George said exactly what I was gonna say very well, better than okay. I could have said it. Thank you. Uh, um, all right, I'll, I'm gonna call on a couple more commenters. Joey, you can raise your hand again if, if you have more questions after that. Um, but I, I now can't remember if Alicia or Daryl was up next. Um, but uh, I guess Daryl is first on my list. So uh, I'm gonna call on Daryl. Okay, uh, so Daryl Beardsley as a resident. So for 10 years for corporate clients, I helped manage multiple public water supplies as part of my tasks. So one thing I would say is whoever, unless you contractually have something different, whoever is officially the owner of the PWS has to be prepared to have emergency plans to ensure supply to uh, customers throughout whatever comes along. Because, and especially because it's residences, there's really not the ability to say, oops, sorry, you're out of water for four days. You know, if you have to truck in water, you have to truck in water. So that would be the one thing I'd say, and maybe that's something you've already worked on, but in terms of how that gets, the responsibility for that gets allocated or the costs associated with it. Hopefully it'll never happen, but those plans are required and, and it's an obligation that the PWS owner takes on for its customers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And then Alicia. Alicia, your hand is up and you're muted right now. I don't I am sorry, I'm on the road. Um, I was just, uh, George and also Paul Durensis basically said what I was going to say, but, um, you know, I think that this is something that needs to be done. Uh, Leland is an important town asset. The town, as Paul pointed out, is holds the land underneath the buildings. Um, at the end of the lease, the buildings and the development will revert to the town. It is also one of our major, actually probably our major uh, source of affordable housing. And uh, it houses people who grew up in Sherburn who otherwise would not be able to stay in their hometown. Uh, and so it's an important town asset. So I would hope advisory and later town meeting will support this uh, proposal. Thank you. Uh, any additional public comment? Right, last call for public comments. Uh, yes, Joey, go ahead. You're still, you're muted. Sorry, I'm on, I'm, I'm in my car too. Um, so Leland Farms is an important asset to the town and we are affordable housing and we need to stay. But right now we spend so much money on water, we can't afford to maintain our buildings. So we're trying, but we don't have any money and we can't, the condo fee is already almost $400 a month for the affordable units. Not never mind the, the, the market rates, but affordable units on top of everything else. So if we're now gonna get sacked with a bill for this interconnection, um, I don't know. I don't know what we can do it. Like how much, how much money are you expecting us to pay to what I was understanding that the town was going to do this interconnection and then we were going to be responsible to maintain it going forward. Not that we would be charged for the work. I don't know. We've already taken out two loans to just to main, just to maintain our own, just to maintain our buildings. So how's that going to work? Um, well, I don't, I mean, I may look to the select board to see if one of you can can answer that. Uh, David David Williams has no. his hand up, not virtually. So, oh, okay, go ahead, David. Uh, my hand does not work. I can only clap. But I didn't <laughs> want to be offensive. Um, this has to be worked out as a body as of the trustees. So 
you have the trustees and you have the elder housing committee and you have the town sitting at the table to um, negotiate. So you really will bring your case to the trustees to make it and then you know negotiate from that point of view. So that will that will happen as soon as possible and you'll be able to negotiate the um, basically what the payback would be um, over time. And we will try to make it as um, least impactful to you as possible. So, um, but that's all to, to be discussed between the three bodies to determine that. To add to that, I think you got to think about it this way, Joey, as well, that if you guys were stuck on your own doing this, it would be a lot more costly. I think by combining it with Woodhaven and splitting the cost with Elder Housing and Leland Farms, so you're all sharing in the cost of the debt. So the debt service is also over a number of years. It's not that you're paying for this whole interconnection. So I don't know what the annual cost of the debt service is going to be on this. I, if maybe somebody else can inform me that. But then that's going to be then split between all the residents of Leland Farm and Woodhaven. So... Oh rather than you guys having to pay for this, like right now, PEP would be requiring you, I think there's an order that says you guys have to do this. So yeah. rather than leaving you guys out on your own, the town is has a warrant article to make this improvement, but at the end of the day, then, then the cost of that debt service is going to be bore by the residents of Leland and Woodhaven. But we're also on a land lease, which means we don't own the land and we pay the town rent basically for our land. And so we're actually maintaining a municipal water system for you, the town. We're paying for it, but you'll eventually own this municipal water system when the lease is ending and we're paying rent as we go along. Shouldn't that come into play? That money does go into an account, Joey. And um, yeah, that would be on the table to come off, to be used. Um, but that, that has to be out in front of all three bodies to see see how much um, is in that account and how much you want to apply um, to that water issue and how much you want reserved sitting with the town for some other issue that might come up. That, <laughs> well, that money was used for the roof a few years ago, so. Um, yeah, and then we took out a loan as well because we couldn't afford the roof. So we, loaned the, we used the money and we took out a loan and we and you're had to- And you know, back we, the loan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we didn't take a loan out from the town. We took a loan out from a bank. Right, we took right. two loans out from banks just, just to maintain our roofs and to, one of our buildings was falling apart because it was built incorrectly. So we had to refix all that. We had to have trucks of water brought in when our water system failed. It's just been really expensive. And, I, right. and I'm, not, I'm not trying to whine. I'm just saying that if we go under and we can't maintain our buildings, the town has dilapidated buildings sitting there on their, right? I mean, we're doing our best, but there's only so much money we can charge these affordable unit owners yeah. to maintain this. Can, and I, there's ten can of, I step ten of in? Them. Can, mm -hmm. Joey, can I step in here? Uh, you know, part of, I, I think the discussion that you're having and your concerns, I'm not saying that they're not valid, but they are to some degree a little bit outside of the scope of exactly what advisory is doing right now. We are essentially saying, do we think that this project is uh, a good project and should it move forward? And we're saying, yes, this project, project should move forward because this is necessary. In fact, it is basically mandated by the DEP. And we are saying that the precise payment arrangement is yet to be determined. And we're saying that the, this project moving forward will be contingent upon that payment arrangement being um, come to between the three parties, which is to say the town, Leland, and Woodhaven. What you're doing right now, I, I know why you're doing it and I support your efforts to do so, but this is not the forum for it because we're okay. not going to determine how the payment is going to happen. Um, so just, that's going just, to be for the future. I just don't want sense. to incur a debt that we can't pay. That's making me nervous. If I if Leland Farms is being stuck yeah. with a debt we can't pay, I mean, I yeah. really, you know, I think that's why I'm, I'm sort but of standing if, up because I am a trustee. I am in charge of our budget yeah. and I don't want to say, oh, sure, this is great. We'll figure it out if we Yes, yeah. but I, I understand that. But our our other option would be to vote no action on this, and then it doesn't go forward. Which would I, well, I, I think, think it should go anybody. forward. It should go forward. Yes. <laughs> Just... I agree. It should go forward, and that's why I want to cut off this discussion because this is a discussion that is important, and it is important for you to have with 
the town administrator, the select board, and the rest of the trustees, and then also the relevant parties from Woodhaven. It's not a discussion that you need to be having with advisory. If okay. Does that make sense? All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions or comments from the public? All right. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment and I would like to open the um, voting session. Can I question uh, from advisory relative to um, the article 10? Oh, hang on a second, I just lost. Steven, we lost your audio, we can't hear you. All right, can you guys hear me now? It sounds like you were talking into like a microphone near you and now you're talking into yeah, a yeah. I, now you're, now you're back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Can I get a motion relative to Article 10, Item 6, um, which is the Woodhaven and Leland Farms public water supply improvements in the amount of $198,000? I move favorable action contingent upon a payment plan for, uh, for this activity being agreed upon among all the relevant parties. Second. All right, I've got a, a motion and a second. Uh, any advisory discussion? Jane, do you think that, uh, does anyone, I guess, does anyone think that this payment plan that you mentioned, you know, that we, you vote yes based on a payment plan to be worked out, right? Does anyone think that can be worked out by town meeting or by the time this has to go to the printers? I don't uh, think we have to be. We're not right, Steve. I mean, we're not we're not correct. putting state on our requirement. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're we're just saying even if it takes six months to to figure that out, that essentially they have time to figure it out, and then once they figure it out, the project can go forward. Oh, okay. I second. Um, all right. I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Steve Leahy? Aye. Peter Galatano? Aye. Brendan Daly? Aye. Wasim Bosley? Aye. Natalie Weir? Aye. Mark Albers? Aye. Drew Cashel? Uh, I'm going to abstain. Okay. And I am an aye. The vote passes 800. One. Uh, 801, sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, it is now 1254, um, so I would like to call a recess for lunch uh, before picking up with the rest of um, capital, um, since I presume we're all kind of at our home. So if I can call maybe 15 minutes, 15 minutes, I think most people who are not on video can feel free to eat while watching. And uh, if you are on video, uh, you can turn your video off and uh, and eat while while we commence. I'm I'm sort of the only one who has to stay on, and I don't want you to watch me eating my lunch. Um, so it's 12:55 now. So if we can come back at 1:10, and uh, nobody will be offended if you are eating lunch while we continue this uh, hearing. <laughs>